will give, let's give Mr. Ted Anderson of GCN a warm welcome. Thanks, Brandy. Uh, you'll see what Brandy will be out there in the back row if you want to help with any questions that you have. Doc will be speaking for about 10 hours. And then after that, questions and answers for the next 10. So, no, I, with, with, without any more, I'm going to bring Doc Waller up so we can get this started. Okay, thank you, Ted, thank you, Brandy, thank you, Nasima, and thank each and every one of you for being here. I think I'm doing this right. Okay, that's kind of close enough. Uh, okay, um, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions so I know who I'm speaking to. How many of you are already using Longevity products? Raise your hand. Okay, 90% of you. All right, uh, how many of you have heard me lecture live before? Okay, good half. And so I do have to go a little slowly. Well, for those of you who haven't heard me speak live before, oh, how many of you hear me on the radio? How many of you listen to me on the radio? Okay, good. The other half, <laughs> that's good. Um, the thing that makes my view different on health is that I have a degree in agriculture from the University of Missouri. I'm a veterinarian uh, from the University of Missouri. And I wrote the first paper on a mass die-off in America from pollution. It had never been written up before. Uh, here in America, and, and I was lucky enough to run into that event and uh, got it written up, and that would direct the rest of my scientific life. That was in 1962. Um, became a comparative pathologist, as Ted alluded to, and worked with Marlon Perkins from the old Mutual Omaha Wild Kingdom show. Some of you are old enough to remember that. He was before the crocodile hunter for you younger ones. Okay, and um, the thing that I was able to do in that project with Washington University in St. Louis was to do these autopsies on both humans and animals. And one project, in one project, I did over 20,000 autopsies on over 454 species of animals and 3,000 humans for comparison. There's over 10 million chemistries and that many slides with special stains. And the book that came out of it is 1,200 pages and it's in the Smithsonian Institute as a national treasure. It will probably never be repeated because the expense today would be over a billion dollars for that project. Well, um, to make a long story short, uh, became a naturopathic physician in 1978, and I've been treating my patients like dogs ever since, and they get better. And the reason why I say that is in the animal industry, we don't have health insurance. There's a huge advantage to veterinarians not to have health insurance for animals. Because when you have health insurance, the concern of the doctor is to get the health insurance. When you don't have health insurance, and let's say it's a cow, um, if you want to treat that cow for 10 years, in cows we don't have insurance. Let's say a pig, if it has double knee replacement, um, the farmer doesn't have insurance for double knee replacement if he has arthritis in his knees, so they just eat them. Goldfish, if it's sick, you just flush them down the toilet, and it's a flush treatment. Okay, a dog, if he has a $2,000 treatment, most of the time he's going to heaven the next day at one o'clock. You know the exact moment because you're gonna get the injection, right? So in humans, we have this problem. There's no law requiring a doctor to cure you when there's a cure available. You assume because you're innocent that he wants to cure you. You assume because you're innocent that doctors want to cure you. Let's say you have diabetes and I can cure you in two to 14 days of diabetes. The doctor makes 300 bucks from a um, uh, office call. The, actually, the, the pharmacist will make more money from, from the medications, right? But if he can treat you for 25 years rather than cure you in three weeks, he makes $750,000. So it's not unethical, it's not unlawful for him to treat you for 25 years. And so which way is he gonna go? $750,000 or 300? And that's the problem with human medicine is insurance. It's the worst possible thing that can happen to human medicine because it made the doctors figure out how to get the insurance. When they treat you, they ameliorate or dampen down symptoms. They do not cure the disease. Every drug, with the exception of antibiotics, which can kill, let's say you have a strep throat, there's antibiotics that can cure strep throat. If you have syphilis, penicillin will cure syphilis. But it's always the infectious disease with an antibiotic that we can cure. There's um, 
250,000 pharmaceuticals that are prescription drugs in the PDR, the physician's desk reference that they have access to, with the exception of antibiotics, which are about 500, so 249,500 are prescription drugs, non-antibiotic, only treat symptoms. There's not a single pharmaceutical other than antibiotics that cures a disease. They all treat symptoms. When does a doctor make the most money? When you're sick or when you're well? When you're sick. When does the pharmaceutical industry make more money when you're sick or when you're well? Now, the medical system has legislated themselves into a protected monopoly. Everybody but medical doctors are quacks. Everybody knows that because medical doctors tell you so. They've legislated themselves into a protected monopoly. They have no oversight by any agency. They self-police and they have unlimited money through government and private insurance. Bam! You're dead. Now, I'm going to show you two things. Number one, I'm going to show you why you must change what you're doing. Then I'm going to show you how to do it. Is that fair? Now hold your questions and comments till the end. This is going to be totally different than any health lecture you've ever seen or heard. Now, how many of you guys and gals know or heard of a guy by the name of Benjamin Rush? Anybody know who Benjamin Rush was? Okay, a couple of guys in the back. Okay, well, Benjamin Rush was the first military surgeon in the United States. He was George Washington's military surgeon. He was the first U.S. Surgeon General, and he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, pledging like all other, the other 56, um, his life, his uh, fortune, and his his um, personal um, good name, okay? And this is part of a letter he wrote to um, Benjamin Franklin and also uh, the other writers of the Constitution, including Thomas Jefferson. Unless we put medical freedom into the Constitution because the different factions of medicine were fighting, uh, herbalists versus chemical users and those using oriental medicine and so forth, they were fighting amongst themselves. And so he was pleading for a, a clause in the Constitution that would equal right to choose religion, right to freedom of speech, right? He wanted another one in there. Unless we put medical freedom into the Constitution, the time will come in medicine, will organize itself into an undercover dictatorship to re Strict the art of healing to one class of men and deny equal privileges to others will constitute the Bastille, which is the most horrible prison in France at the time, of medical science. All such laws are un-American and despotic. Well, of course, that didn't happen. This clause didn't get into the Constitution, and now his worst nightmares have come true 300 years later. Now, we spend more money for health care than all the other nations in the world combined. There's 204 nations registered in the United Nations. Of those 204 nations, we spend more money for health care than all the rest, not more than any nation, more than all nations. And what do we get for it? We rank 92nd in healthfulness in the world. There's 91 other nations whose peoples are healthier than us. We rank 60th in longevity. There's 59 other nations whose peoples live longer than us. And God forgive us, we rank 41st when it comes to live births and first month survivability of babies. And that doesn't even count the abortion piece. Time Magazine, December 2008, cover article. The sorry state of American health. Despite technological advances in medicine, Americans are less healthy than we used to be, and the next generation, our kids are going to be worse off. How many of you have heard that, that their kids are not going to live as long as the adults? Okay, that's two-thirds of you. What they're saying here is, is statistically, three-quarters of you in this room will be standing at gravesite bearing your children, unless we change what we're doing. Petitions of the doctors, petitions of the government aren't going to change anything. That's not going to change anything. There's only one way to change the system, and that is to not use it. Cut off their cash flow, suddenly now they become real humble. But you have to make that decision. Well, that takes responsibility on your part, and I'm here to teach you the things you can do for yourself to avoid using them unnecessarily. That makes sense? So that's where we're going. Just so you don't think I made that up. In ranking of newborn deaths, again, we're 41st in the world when it comes to live births and first month survivability of babies. And they say it's a shame. It's not a shame, it's an absolute crime. And most OBGYN, uh, o, most OBGYNs and most um, 
pediatrician should go to jail for it. I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the scientific journal called Food Chemistry. It looks at the nutritional value of food grown here in the United States and food imported in the United States. It also looks for pollution, so I'm kind of familiar with that one. And in the April issue of this year, April 2012, there was a big article in there that looked at eight very well-known, trusted names in baby foods, Gerber's, Simulac, Infamil, these kind of things. And what they said was that commercially available baby foods contain less than 20% of the recommended levels of many vitamins and minerals, and, and less than 20%. This is why we have autism and ADD and ADHD. It has nothing to do with vaccinations, nothing. I've looked at the, the um, batch numbers and the ingredients and manufacturers. They send the same batch numbers and the same ingredients in, uh, all over the world. And 95% of all autism occurs here in the United States. So it can't be the vaccinations because it is used everywhere else. So what is it? It's malnutrition of the brain. You cannot make a good brain on fruity pebbles and apple juice. Most kids who have uh, autism and ADD and ADHD are normal until they go from formula to solid food. What's their solid food? Pop-tarts and Welch's grape juice, you know, Sunny Delight and Eggos with syrup. All carbohydrates, carbohydrates, carbohydrates. There's no fats, there's no proteins, there's no vitamins, there's no minerals, and you get what you get. You can't make a brain on carbohydrates only. So here's your pediatrician that should go to jail. This is from May of this year, cover article in Newsweek magazine. And the first reaction of most people is to have a little giggle because he's a cute little fat kid, year old. Uh, he's clutching his supersized bag of french fries. But this is probably the scariest slide you're going to see tonight because this is one of the reasons why your kids will not live as long as you. They're predicting already that this kid here, a year old, when, he, when I grow up, I'm going to weigh 300 pounds. Raise your hand if you know we're the number one obese nation of the world. Anybody know that? Yeah, well, good. I don't know, it's kind of interesting line there and those people don't know. Um, <laughs> Um, we're the number one ob uh, obese nation in the world. The only thing that we're number one in the health industry is obesity. Now, what does that tell you about the medical systems and the government's knowledge about obesity? They know nothing! Otherwise, we'd be number 204. We should be the slimmest, trimmest, fittest people on earth. But they know nothing about the thing that makes us the sickest people on earth. Obesity, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Another little piece here came out the 19th of September, just about a month ago. In 2010, 36% of Americans were obese. 2030, they're projecting that 50% will be obese. Now, what that tells you is they know nothing, because if they knew something and they could predict what's going to happen in 20 years, they should say, well, it's 36% now, but it'll, in 20 years, it'll be 20%. Another 20 years, it'll be 5%. But instead, it's going up, which means they have no earthly idea how to stop it. Some states, like Mississippi, the most obese nation, or excuse me, the state in, in America, the most obese right now, they're um, going to be 66.7%, almost 67% obesity. Two-thirds obesity is what they're projecting for. Same thing for Maryland, uh, or Delaware, I guess it is Delaware, 64.7%, almost 65%. And then you're looking at South Carolina, 63%. This young fellow died at 21 years of age of Crohn's disease and a certain type of uh, liver disease called uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis, which is a simple nutritional deficiency. How many of you heard of Crohn's disease? Okay, Crohn's disease is a simple problem, very simple problem. They say it's an autoimmune thing and he fought valiantly for 11 years and then he died. All they did was give him prednisone and cortisone and you know, tell him to eat, you know, give up lettuce and stupid things like that, right? And he died at 21 years of age of complications of Crohn's disease and liver disease. All he had to do was go on a gluten-free diet, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, go on a gluten-free diet, take the 90 cents of nutrients, and he'd live to be 121. But when it comes to these things, doctors are either very stupid or they're criminals, because if they know the answer and they, they choose to treat him rather than cure him, they should have cured him when he's 10 years old in, in three to six months. But if they're ignorant, that means they don't know what to do. If they know what to do and they are, choose to treat him for a long period of time for the money, that means they're criminals, right? Yeah. And so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and just say they're stupid, ignorant people. 
This came out October 11th. This is month. Stroke rates increase among younger patients. It's happening in younger and younger and younger people now that are getting stroke. And there's many, many reasons for that, but the basic reason is there's two types of stroke. 85% of all strokes are caused by blood clots in the brain, thrombotic stroke. This is caused by a simple deficiency, the omega-3 essential fatty acids, or a ratio problem between omega-3, 6s, and 9s. Now I'll show, I'll propose to you, I actually sued the FDA over this and prevailed in federal court, and I'll show you what to do to prevent strokes very simply. AARP, their monthly bulletin, American Association of Retired People. I'm glad to see so many young people in here because we got to start young, right? We can't wait till people, they, my doctor says I have three seconds to live. Can you save me with vitamins? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you'd be amazed at how many people I get like that. Oh, I heard your tape 20 years ago. I didn't do anything and now I got two seconds to live. Can you help me? Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so the AARP bulletin, March of this year, the worst place to be in America when you're sick is an American hospital. And I took two pieces out of the body of the article, and one of which is the number of American patients who die each year from American hospital errors is equal to four jumbo jets crashing each week. That's about 1,200 to 1,500 people per week. How many of you would fly commercial airlines if you knew they killed 1,200 to 1,500 passengers every week? Nobody would fly! I must see my doctor. I must see my doctor. And then also, in the same issue, each U.S. surgeon, each U.S. surgeon operates on the wrong person, wrong body part as often as 40 times a week. Boy, that brought silence to the room. That's because they're usually intoxicated on alcohol, street drugs, or prescription drugs, and that comes from a six-year-ago study by Lucien LePay, who's the head of the Department of Public Health at Harvard Medical School, and he went around and blindly took blood samples from doctors. He just showed up and took blood samples from them, and he ran them, and 52% are intoxicated during their working day on something. That's why they make so many mistakes. It's published stuff from Harvard Medical School. Newsweek Magazine cover article. Why is that guy terrified? <laughs> well, he's not even anesthetized, and those surgeons are ready to stick him with their scalpels, and that's because if they even touch him with their scalpels before he undergoes anesthesia, they've started their procedure. If he dies during the induction of anesthesia, which happens quite frequently because they don't turn on the oxygen, and because they're drunk, and he dies, let's say, during the induction of anesthesia, they can run off and play golf for four hours and still get paid their $100,000. So they want to start the procedure, right? Now, the one word that will save your life in a hospital is a two-letter word that every two-year-old knows. No! Whatever they tell you, you're going to say, respond by saying no. Now, what is a guy afraid of? I mean, this is a universal fear posture, right? It doesn't matter what language you speak. If you're doing this, you're afraid of something. Now, let's say you're in the hospital, you have fourth stage cancer, it's gone to the regional lymph nodes, maybe gone from your colon to your lungs, and you're in real trouble. They say, look, we've given you four rounds of chemotherapy, and nothing seems to be working, but we have this new experimental drug coming out in a couple of weeks, and, and we want to try it on you. Your response should be, no! Because they know that it's not going to work on you. 97% of the time, chemotherapy doesn't work for cancer. That's published in the Journal of Oncology about three years ago. 97% of the time, chemotherapy is useless. But they've got to give you something. It'll shrink the tumor a little bit, but you still die. Okay, now, so this experimental drug is gonna be the same way. It's gonna shrink the tumor a little bit, but you still die. And so what they're asking you to do is to let them use you as a guinea pig to see if just the injection of the drug kills you. Because they have to have 100 patients who will be injected with the drug, and they have to have less than three die from the drug itself before they prove it. So they're looking for the village idiot to say, okay, see if I'm the one you're gonna kill. So what is he afraid of? Well, there's seven physicians on the other facing page, and I want you to look at their body language and their faces to see if they're coming at to him as good Samaritans. They remind me of the Walking Dead series on TV. The doctors of the Walking Dead. And the reason why they're coming for him is he is the only one in the hospital with money. Everybody else is a Medicare patient. They don't have any money. They'll play hockey out there. They'll knock each other down because they want to be the one to get to him to get the money. These are not 
uncommon things. Usually Reader's Digest is a very chummy magazine with really great stories. You know, the dog drags a kid out of the fire in the house and the two-year-old calls 911 and saves grandma from a heart attack. But look at this cover article in 2007, June of 2007. Fatal hospital mistakes! Now how common is that? Well, in 1999, I made one of my, I don't know, 30 or 36 CDs I have out there. And I, I used, I have to admit, I used the title of a movie. Um, how many of you have heard of the Ray Milan movie? Some of you are old enough to remember that old Ray Milan movie, Dial M for Murder. Dial M for, it's a great movie. And then it was remade here about 10 years ago or 15 years ago with Michael Douglas. It was called The Perfect Murder. The same storyline, just new technology and stuff to make it modern but it was the same storyline. All I did was change it by one letter. Instead of saying dial M for murder, I said dial MD for murder. The doctors didn't like that. They just like went crazy. And in, in this CD, in this CD, I, I, I read this stuff from this newspaper article. Each year in America, VA medical doctors make 3,000 mistakes, which, which cost the patient there a limb or an eye or uh, to stay in the hospital for another six months because of infections or whatever. And of those 3,000 mistakes that are inflicted on VA patients every year by VA doctors, the VA doctors kill 700 veterans that have escaped death at the hands of the enemy. So they come home to be treated by our doctors, our doctors kill them. They come home to be treated by our doctors at the VA hospital, and each year the VA doctors kill 700 of our veterans that went out there to protect us. And the doctors get a walk, they never go to jail because they have a protected monopoly. They can kill, maim, rape, and, and burn to, with impunity, and, and they're untouchable. This came out, it was a full page story in the USA Today in February 2007. I had to chop it up a little bit to get on this eight and a half by 11. Look at, the, look at the title here, Patient, Protect Thyself. Now the data that I'm gonna share with you came from the Journal of the American Medical Association, very, very well respected journal, whether you agree with them or not, they are very well respected. And then the Center for Disease Control, which is a federal agency in Atlanta, Georgia, that looks at this stuff. And what the article said was, each year in America, each year in America, medical doctors kill, injure, and infect 15 million of their customers in a workplace. They get a walk, they don't even get an OSHA ticket. Each year in America, medical doctors kill, injure, and infect 15 million of their customers in a workplace. 5.8 million in hospitals and 9.2 million in private offices and clinics. How many of you would fly commercial airlines if you knew that they killed, injured, and infected 15 million passengers every year? Nobody would fly. This is one of my favorites. Each year in America, medical doctors inflict 2 million infections on hospital patients. Of those 2 million infections, 90,000 die. They kill 90,000 people each year just from infections that they inflict on the patient. Now, <clears throat> How can that happen? Well, that's because they wear the same white coat, the same pantyhose, the same trousers, the same shoes from room to room to room, dragging pee, poop, blood, pus, snot, gunk, viruses, bacteria, everything you can think of. By contrast, in a pig barn, by federal law, you're required to disinfect your boots when you go from one pig pen to the next because you want to be dragging swine flu with you. We treat pigs better than we do people. We treat pigs in a barn better than we do people in a hospital. Now, I want you to think about this. If Iran were to ship over one of their intercontinental ballistic missiles, which they're always testing, with a WMD, a weapon of mass destruction, that was a biological weapon, a bioweapon with viruses and bacteria in it, it would kill 90,000 people. Let's say they lobbed that thing right into Minneapolis and killed 90,000 people in a couple of weeks or a month. What we do, what we do? Well, we declare war, we just go over there and flatten that country into rubble, kill a lot of people. You know, well, uh, please say you're sorry. No, probably not. Would, would we sue them and say, we, we want some retribution, we want a million dollars per person for everyone you kill? Probably not, we declare war and we go kill them all. Well, here you have doctors that kill 90,000 every year, just simply because they don't wash their hands after they go potty. Yummy, yummy. <laughs> now, how can I say that? Well, this came out in August, about two, almost exactly two months ago. Tomorrow will be two months ago. One bacteria causes 30,000 deaths in hospitals every year. That's one third of the 90,000, right? There's one bacteria, C. diff, it's Clostridium differentians, 
which is only found in human poop. It's a human poop bacteria. It's a human feces bacteria. It comes only from doctors and nurses not washing their hands patient to patient to patient. To show you how concerned they are about it, doctors, in 1993, there were 85,700 cases of C. diff infections in hospitals reported. And by 2010, it went up 400% to 346,800. Is it getting better or worse? Well, the numbers work. It's getting worse. So when do you say is enough enough? When do you get pissed off enough to say enough is enough? We're not going to use you guys anymore. Why don't you think, remember when that Toyota, there was six, uh, six was it, uh, 60 people got killed. 60 people got killed in, in, was it four years or five years from Toyota's accelerator problem? 12, 12 people a year. I mean, it was a big hoo-ha. I mean, everybody's suing for billions of dollars, front page stories, it was a mess. Here we have one trade in their workplace, they kill 90,000 from infections every year because they don't wash their hands after they go potty. Nobody cares. That's because they have a protected monopoly. Are you beginning to get a picture here? Now this is another one of my favorites because I got some very famous examples to show you. Hospital care fatal for some patients. Well, that's kind of fatal, you know, vanilla. Uh, results of Medicare study alarming. Well, that's alarming. Well, the study was done by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Inspector General. Office of Inspector General. Well, that's the auditor for Medicare. What they said was each month in America, medical doctors kill 15,000 Medicare patients with, with non-invasive procedures. Each month, medical doctors kill 15,000 medication, Medicare patients from non-invasive procedures. How many of you fly commercial airlines if you know they killed 15,000 seniors a month? Especially if you're a senior. I ain't going on that plane, man. I'm driving. Well, let's look at some famous people that they've killed who are seniors. How about Andy Rooney? Anybody, anybody remember Andy Rooney from 60 Minutes? Sunday afternoon, it's kind of a TV show. Well, he retired almost exactly a year ago. In, August, in October of last year, he retired. He's 92 years old, and he and his wife are going to go on this world cruise. And so they decided they were going to go in for a physical in case they need to take some medication with them. They didn't want to be out in the ocean for six months and have to go to some doctor in a foreign country that they didn't know and all that kind of stuff. And so the doctor for Andy Rooney, he's kind of leafing through his medical records and he says, Andy, you're 92 years old here and I can't find where you've ever had a colonoscopic exam. I mean, there could be cancer lurking around in there. And of course, he had no symptoms, no bleeding in his bowel movements, no pain, no weight loss. He's happy as a clam waiting to go on his his um, cruise. And what he should have said was, no! But instead, what he said was, okay, because he didn't want to offend the doctor in a white coat and a stethoscope. So the doctor sticks a garden hose up his rump, punctures his intestine. Three days later, he's dead from peritonitis, a belly infection. Nothing wrong with the guy, and the doctor kills him. Now, they didn't name the doctor. They didn't name the hospital because if that the hospital and the doctor's name went out, I mean, my God, it would interrupt their cash flow. Everybody would cancel. It would be a mess, right? So they're not going to name those guys. Now, what makes this really bad is in here, the cause of death is listed. You go online and look at Andy Rooney obituary, and you'll find him. They always say, Mr. Rooney died of complications of a minor medical procedure. Well, one, one minor for him. It killed him. Doctor gets a walk, hospital gets a walk. How many of you heard of Dick Clark, you know, American Bandstand? Okay. He went in for an outpatient procedure. He was supposed to be having the procedure 11, done by 11.30, out in the golf course by 1 o'clock. That's what he was told. Now, what he was going to have was one of those little rotor rooter things on his prostate gland because he'd have to stand in front of the toilet for, you know, two or three minutes before he could get a urine stream going. So instead of coming to me and getting it fixed, with nutrition, it's a simple nutritional problem. Instead of getting it fixed with nutrition, he opts for the scientific thing. Let's do surgery and rotor root it out. Starts at 11 o'clock as scheduled. 11:30, he's dead. He died of a coronary thrombosis. That happens to 30,000 men each year within an hour after the procedure. Now, there's another 200,000 each year that have a stroke or coronary thrombosis, but they don't die. 30,000 of them die every year from that procedure. I'll show you that fact in a minute. Now, how do you remember a guy by the name of Neil? Anybody remember Neil? I'll give you one more piece of the name. How about Neil Armstrong? 
how many remember Neil Armstrong, our top astronaut, right? The first guy to step foot on the moon. He saved, single-handedly, he saved two NASA missions. Saved the spacecraft, saved two crews. It, it, it was a mess that he saved NASA from a terrible disaster two times. So he's 82 years old. He goes in for his physical. They say, Neil, you're 82 years old. We've never seen a specimen like you. He's 82 years old. You're as fit as can be. That NASA program must be really great. But we did find one little thing we're concerned about. You have a, 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 a blocked artery. You got a 30% blockage in a coronary artery. Now, it's not dangerous now. You don't even have symptoms. No, I don't have any chest pain or anything. No angina, okay, you're not breath. No, he said, I can run 20 miles every day, no problem. Okay, well, you're fit now. And what we're proposing is we don't wait for five years until it's 70% blocked or 85% blocked. We don't wait until you have a heart attack in the middle of the night and you die on the way to the hospital. You're fit now, and all we want to do is go in there and put a stint in there, do a bypass, and you'll never have to worry about a heart attack. I mean, we were lucky, we found it early. Yes, sir! Good naval airman. Let's go for it. Well, what did Neil die from? He didn't die of a heart attack. He died from complications resulting from cardiovascular procedures. See, the story was not all the wonderful things that Neil Armstrong did in his life. That was not the story. The headline should have been, Doctors Kill Top Astronaut! But since they have a, a protective monopoly, they killed him and they're hiding. You don't know who the doctor was that killed him. But if it had been a successful thing, that it had this news conference and all the white coats and stethoscopes, and oh yeah, it was a very difficult thing and we saved the astronaut and how wonderful, my name is Dr. Solon, here's my 800 number, you can call me for appointments, and it would have been a big hoo-ha, right? But since they killed him, they're not gonna let you know who they are. Are you beginning to get a picture here? So if they can kill an Andy Rooney, a Dick Clark, and Neil Armstrong, and another couple of hundred thousand people each year who are nameless because they're not famous, Michael Jackson, there's another one, stupid Dr. Murray, probably snorting half of Michael's drugs. You know, Michael just happened to pick one of the dumbest, most careless doctors on earth. Now, how many of you heard of cholesterol? Raise your hand. You know, the substance cholesterol. Okay, good. Now, I'm here to tell you that there's not a single disease that's caused by elevated blood cholesterol. There's not a single disease that's caused by elevated blood cholesterol. Elevated blood cholesterol is a red warning light. How many of you have ever seen the red warning light in the dashboard of a car? Whether it turns on or not, you know there's a red warning light, right? There's something's going on with the engine. Can you name me anything that the, that the any mechanical or chemical or electrical thing that the red warning light inflicts upon your vehicle. No, the red warning light, is, as the name implies, it warns you that something bad's going on. You need to add more coolant, you need to add more oil. Uh, you may have blown a head gasket, you don't want to drive it, you want to get towed in so you can get the engine fixed. That's what the red warning light is warning you, right? Well, elevated blood cholesterol is a warning. I wrote that up in 1971. It was published, it was like translated into six languages in a Danish um, pathology journal. Acta Pathologica, and it was, it was a big thing. And I compared clogged arteries in vegans versus meat eaters. Vegans, of course, I think you're all young enough to know that vegans are people who are vegetarians who eat nothing but grains, vegetables, fruits, and nuts, no animal products, and they believe that's a healthy thing. But I don't believe it's healthy. This is a political statement because they say, okay, well, one cow eats as much food as 50 people. If, if we're all eat stuff like cows, uh, and get the cow out of the cycle, we can feed 50 more people, right? I mean, that's how vegans think. Well, a cow has four stomachs. You can't process grass the same way a cow does. You got 50,000 little helpers in there. I mean, 50,000 individual organisms, 50,000 different species of individual organisms. You got billions and billions and billions of little organisms there that do things that you don't have the capacity to do. So you can't live on pasture grass like a cow. So being a vegan is a political statement rather than a nutritional statement, right? So what he did, when you, when you do 20,000 plus autopsies in all these different species and 3,000 humans, 10 million slides, 10 million chemistries, you can write a lot of articles, which I did, right? One of which was comparing 
the amount of clogging of the coronary arteries in, in vegans versus meters. Guess who had the worst clogged arteries? Vegans. Because of poorly uh, stored grains, the oils in the grains oxidize and turn into trans fatty acids, free radicals, which inflame the arteries and cause them to clog. Another thing that happens with vegans, they stir fry organic vegetables in extra, 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 virgin, 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 virgin olive oil. <laughs> Turns into trans fatty acids, inflames your arteries and clogs your arteries. Somebody who lives on, you know, the meat and potatoes guy, as long as he's not burning the meat, if he's eating his meat raw, you know, or medium, or medium rare, and having some baked potatoes, he won't get clogged arteries because there's no trans fatty acids in any of that. You're getting a picture here. So just because somebody says something's good when you have to look at it and see if it really is. Well, again, cholesterol is not bad. If you have elevated blood cholesterol, the normal cholesterol for human beings, the normal range is 220 to 270. 220 to 270 is the normal range. And if you have a, a blood cholesterol without medication that's below 200, you have glu um, a gluten intolerance because you can't absorb cholesterol. I've seen people with a cholesterol at 60 and their doctor says, man, you, you can eat 10 eggs a day and not worry about it. You, you've got cholesterol 90, and man, you're lucky. No, 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 you're dying because you have gluten intolerance. You can't absorb cholesterol, which is a very big, complicated molecule. Okay? So FDA adds new safety information to statin drugs, cholesterol-lowering drugs. February 2012. Federal health officials are adding new safety warnings about the risk of statin drugs for memory loss, Alzheimer's disease, and elevated blood sugar. If you take statin drugs to lower your cholesterol for 10 years, and at the same time you're on a cholesterol-restricted diet, you're going to increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease by 100%. In other words, you're going to get Alzheimer's disease as predictable as gravity. I'll tell you why in a minute. Also, if you're on statin drugs to lower your cholesterol and you have a cholesterol-restricted diet for 10 years, you increase your risk of type 2 diabetes by 50%. What causes elevated blood cholesterol and glycerides is it's a red warning light for diabetes, it's a red warning light for low thyroid, it's a red warning light for deficiencies of six different minerals. It in itself causes nothing. I said that in 1971 and everybody, well, I shouldn't say everybody, there was 25 doctors I used to hang around with and of course, they just put their arms around and said, oh, Wallach, I mean, you know, you must be sniffing glue. Everybody knows it's the, it's the cholesterol, man. Well, they all took their statin drugs, and guess what? They're all dead, I'm alive. <laughs> God is good. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Science News is kind of a a summary uh, journal for doctors. They, they look at thousands of scientific articles. Uh, written every month and they summarize them so doctors can read the summaries which usually are a half a page and uh, they, they, they like something they can send somebody to get the entire article they don't have to read thousands of articles this came out in June of this year good cholesterol not so beneficial high higher HDL high, de uh, high density lipoprotein the good cholesterol don't reduce heart attacks I said that in 1971 everybody laughed at me now it's published you can go back and read it okay and so it's nice to be redeemed a little bit, right? I'm going to go to each of their graves and put one of these on there. <laughs> okay, now there's not a single medical screening test that prevents a disease. And I saw on TV the other night where the American Cancer Society is still talking about get your screens to prevent cancer. There's not a single screening test, medical screening test that prevents a disease. Now it might catch it earlier, we can get into the treatment system, which can be a bad or good thing, right? So this is the Globe and Mail, which is the USA Today equivalent in Canada. It's a national newspaper. I just like this title along with that picture here. Screening is not prevention. Now, how many of you ladies have heard of mammograms? Raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, you're probably lying. Okay, even men have heard of mammograms, right? And that's one of the great screens that doctors like to use. OBGYNs, your primary care physician will send you in for a mammogram every year once you're 40 years of age. Well, you know, women, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years ago when these things were really being pushed, they said, what about all that radiation? I wanna, you know, I'm trying to stay away from radiation. I'm protesting against nuclear power plants. We want me to put my breast in that machine. Oh, it's insignificant radiation. How many women have heard that? Yeah. Well, it just came out about three weeks ago 
they said one mammogram, one mammogram gives you the amount of radiation of 500 chest x-rays. Well, we're sorry, a little mistake, it was a decimal point problem. <laughs> One mammogram, one CAT scan, one MRI gives you the equivalent radiation of 500 chest x-rays. If you have one mammogram, ladies, a year for five years, it increases your risk of breast cancer by 20%. And if you're taking HRT, if you're taking you know, estrogen along with that, uh-oh, you're up to 60% increase in risk of breast cancer. If you're, if you're eating your meat cooked well done at the same time, it increases your risk of breast cancer by 462%. I'll actually show you that, that, exper that experiment was done. It was a 20 year study on the nurses health study by the University of South Carolina on um, 90,000 nurses over 20 years. It increases your risk of breast cancer by 462%. Now to see, does Susan G. Coleman tell you that? No. So. Next time your doctor says, look, it's time for you, I'm looking in here, you're beyond your year, you need to go get a mammogram. You should say, well, I don't think I want to do that. I'm concerned about the safety. And the doctor will say, well, I insist because I'm, I'm well responsible for your health and I don't want you to get breast cancer. Now, what he's really saying is I don't want to give up my $400 I get kicked back from the radiology laboratory because radiology is one of the things that doctors get kickbacks on. If you get an ultrasound, they get 10 bucks. A mammogram, it's 400 bucks. They're happy about those things, right? Now, so what you're going to say, ladies, is this. Look, <clears throat> I'm concerned about safety. And if you can convince me it's safe, I'll do the mammogram. And here's what I want you to do. What I want you to do is put your testicles in the machine. <laughs> and I want you to let me be the one to crank down on that plate <laughs> until you groan a little bit. <sighs> then I want to be the one to yell to the guy standing behind the two inches of lead and say, hit it, Frank! If you'll let me do those three things, I'll get the mammogram. And you know what that doctor's going to say? No! <laughs> you can do your own self-examination at 10 o'clock in the morning on the 15th of every month, even if you're 10 years into menopause, and keep a log and map out your breast for all the little bumps and lumps or you've had all your life, you know, kind of thing. And, but suddenly now this little pea-sized knot that's been there forever it's a little tender now, it never used to be tender. Go get a high definition ultrasound. It'll actually give you more information than a mammogram, there's no radiation. Now you guys don't get off easy. A federal panel now is discouraging PSA prostate screening. Why PSA risk might not be worth, and this is where that 30,000 number came from. How do men fare after this surgery? Oops, Houston, we have a problem. Time Magazine, Health and Science section, June 4th, 2012. Skip the PSA screen. Experts say PSA blood tests for prostate cancer don't save lives. Now, <clears throat> Warren Buffett was diagnosed with prostate cancer in April of this year, and he chose aggressive treatment, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. Has anybody seen or heard of him in the last six months? Is he dead in the freezer waiting for the stock market to go right before they reveal his death? I mean, is he off recovering in some island someplace, or is he in a coma, is he in a hospice? I mean, we don't have any, we don't know what's going on, right? But anyway, this is his story, but the most important piece of the story when this was written up was this paragraph here. Richard Ablin, the scientist who discovered the PSA test, calls the testing's widespread use a public health disaster because it gives a 98% false positive, gives the doctors permission to kill you. Prostate cancer does not kill anybody. If you have prostate cancer, you die. It's always from the treatment. It never goes to your liver, your lungs, your brain. It never kills you. It goes regionally. It'll go into your pelvic bones, your lumbar vertebrae, and your leg bones, but that's it. Probably 90% of all men who die over the age of 85 have prostate cancer. It's usually the size of the head of a pin. Never left the prostate gland, but the PSA test is like 100 instead of below five like it's supposed to be. Oh my God, uh, uh, oh, oh, you gotta get treatment here. Hmm, you're dead. Now, doctors have become pre-grave robbers. I got a couple more of these, then you'll understand where doctors are coming from, then I'll tell you what to do for it, okay? But I got a few more to show you. A couple more categories here. Medicare cost for hospice is up 70% every year. 70%, 70%, 70%. How much does it cost to stick your finger in somebody's carotid artery to see if they're dead? You don't need a lot of technology there, right? 
And uh, so why would hospice go up 70% every year? Well, here's why. Doctors become pre-grave robbers. Let's say you're in a hospice. Let's say it's Grandma Daisy. Grandma Daisy's in a hospice. And she's got um, um, stage four colon cancer has gone to her brain. She's in a coma. She's being fed IV. And the doctor calls for a conference, the immediate family. They're at the hospice, and they're all sitting their tears coming down, looking at Grandma Daisy there. She's kind of gonzo. She's in a coma because of this cancer has gone from her colon to her brain. The doctor's saying, look, she, we can pull the plug, plug. She'll be dead in three days. But I recommend we kind of do what we can to keep her going here. And I want you to sign a paper allowing us to re resuscitate her if she has cardiac arrest because there's this new drug coming along. And it might just help her. Of course, the instinct is to, to, to want to grasp onto that last straw, right? And, yeah, well, let's go for it. You know, we got insurance. And, uh, it'll pay for it. And so everybody, especially, as you, invariably, it's the biggest guy in the family. You know, the grandson who's seven foot tall, tight end, you know, weighs 300 pounds and can kill you with a look, right? And he looks at the doctor and says, whatever Grandma Daisy needs, she gets, right? And the doctor, oh, yes, sir. Grandma Daisy, was the best. she ironed our underwear. She made all our food from scratch. Nothing ever canned or frozen. She was the best. Whatever Grandma Daisy needs, she gets. And as he's walking out the door, whatever Grandma Daisy, don't forget, she gets the best. You know, oh, yes, sir. Well, as soon as everybody signs a paper and they've left the room, this doctor, this hospice doctor, is on the internet calling all his golf buddies. I checked out Grandma Daisy here, and she's got $300,000 left in all her accounts between Medicare, her private insurance, and everything, and her supplements. She's got $300,000. They're there in a heartbeat. <laughs> they give her a hysterectomy, double mastectomy. They'll do a double hip replacement, double knee replacement, cataract surgeries. If she has one tooth, they'll yank that, do an upper and lower dentures. And then they put implants in her middle ear because she was deaf. And then they pull the plug, say, oh, and they call them. Say, oh, Grandma Daisy had a turn for the worse, and she died. But only after they get the money. So what I want you to do is have hospice at home. Medicare will pay for hospice at home. Everybody comes there and needs to come there and do whatever's necessary, give her a better thing, but you have some control here. You let her have her dog in her bed with her. You let the grandkids sleep with her if they want. She can have a gallon of ice cream every night if she wants. You can't give Grandma Daisy ice cream in a hospice. She's dying. You, you can't let the grandkids come in. She's in intensive care. You can't let grandkids come in to give Grandma Daisy a hug. Do you see the difference here? Why do you want the people you love dying by themselves when the nurses are all chasing the doctors around in the library at night? <laughs> After all, that's where the plush chairs are. <laughs> Just so you know that I'm not making this stuff up, Dr. Repeat Surgery Pro gives up license. Now this guy, did, he had 10 times the number of repeat surgeries on people than any other doctor in the state of Oregon. And it was only because he had 40 lawsuits against him that the, <laughs> that the organization did something about it. This came out on September 7th of this year. U.S. healthcare wastes $750 billion. That's three quarters of a trillion dollars. That's three quarters of a trillion, trillion dollars. Every year, the medical system waste three quarters of a trillion dollars a year. That's your tax money. Now, what, what, what was the waste for? Unneeded care in hospice. I never say anything I can't back up. This is going to make you feel warm and fuzzy. Each of you owes the Chinese government $534,000, <laughs> which totals $62 trillion. Now, why is that? Well, that's because over the last 30 years, each one of your elected officials in Washington, regardless of party, independents, libertarians, Democrats, Republicans, they all did it. What they did was they took all your money from your Social Security funds, your Medicare and your Medicaid funds, and gave it over to the highway departments, which you see all this highway work going on here. <laughs> that's your Social Security money. That's your Social Security money. Okay? And, and this was so they could come back and say, I brought home the bacon last year. I got 100 new jobs in this district, and I want you to reelect me. Oh, yeah, we got, got 100 new jobs. We got to reelect you. <laughs> well, when the, when the first, when the first um, 
baby boomers came along, 80 million of them, the first wave about four years ago came along. Okay, we're here for our social security. Everybody's looking at each other in Washington. We don't have any money. They're here for their money, we don't have any money. So, well, you gotta wait six months. Next year, you gotta wait another six months. And so now I think you gotta be 70 before you get your first payment in social security. It used to be 65, right? You gotta keep waiting and waiting and waiting. And that's why, because there's no money there. So they run to the Chinese, we need money. Okay, we'll give you the $62 trillion. We want some security here. So what security did they have to give for $62 trillion? It wasn't a signature in their name. <laughs> what it was was all the weekly revenues from federal lands. Oil leases, uh, we're talking about timber permits, grazing permits, uh, all of the um, uh, tolls from the federal toll roads. Weekly, bypasses all the American banks and goes straight to China, not even keeping up with the interest, because this is a year old, it's now 70 trillion. This is outside that 16 trillion that's, you know, we're behind in our budget this year. We're behind in our budget, 16 trillion. That doesn't count this. I knew that would make you feel warm and fuzzy. <laughs> now doctors are always at the bottom of it. This came out in 1997. A 1997 study by the Health Insurance Association of America found that 75% of insurance fraud, which is a federal crime, is committed by providers, which is a code word for doctors. You do that, you go to jail. Doctors do it, they get a walk. Now you do have to change your diet. Now we're just changing subjects a little bit here. You have to change your diet, part of your responsibility. There's 20 of these billboards around the beltway around Chicago. You say, why on earth would they do that? That's because 75 years ago, the average age of diagnosis of colon cancer was 60, well now it's 38. And so this billboard is directed to eight-year-olds. Now you talk to a, an eight-year-old about Grandma Daisy dying of um, colon cancer. Well, she was 82 years old. I, I, I'm only eight, that's a million years from now. I'm not worried about colon cancer. And so this is directed to eight-year-olds. Well, Mama, what's, what's butt cancer? <laughs> Well, when I was a kid 30, well, no, when I was a kid 73 years ago, geez, when I was a kid 73 years ago, um, I had processed meats with nitrates in it once a year. That was ham on Easter. Now, kids have processed meats with nitrates in it 15 times a day. They get bacon and eggs, they get ham and eggs, they get sausage and eggs, they get the all meat breakfast with 14 different types of sausage and bacon and ham and pastrami and pepperoni and jerky. And then they get the bacon bits in their salads. They have bacon burgers and there's in their little Lunchables, there's these little rods made from pepperoni. And, you know, they're getting all this nitrates and nitrates. And then there's fried foods. You gotta give up fried foods. This guy's been dead for 35 years. He's still killing people. Now you can eat safely at these places, you can eat safely at McDonald's, you can eat safely at KFC, but you gotta be very restricted on what you pick. In KFC, you can only eat the KRC, Kentucky Roasted Chicken, and their salad bar, that's it. Nothing else in there is, is safe. Same way with McDonald's. When I go to McDonald's, I do that two or three times a week because I'm on the road. I only eat their um, Angus burgers. I get the Swiss uh, uh, mushroom one. No mayonnaise, no bun. I have them add lettuce, pickles, tomatoes, and, and so I'm having a little piece of meat and I'm having a little salad with no dressing or anything on it. I do get their um, uh, mild salsa, tear a little packet, put the mild salsa on there, and then I'll, I'll drink their wild berry smoothies and I will have their parfaits, which is a little yogurt that has blueberries and, and um, um, strawberries in it. That's the only three things I'll eat at McDonald's. But it's very sad, going to McDonald's as often as I do, I always see grandmothers and grandfathers, you know, they're like in their 70s and 80s. Here's a little kid in a high chair, two, three years old, and he's, you know, smashing potatoes and doing the things that little kids do in high chairs. And here's grandma with the chicken McNuggets, and she's, she's always ripping the skin off the chicken McNuggets. See? Little Frankie, watch grandma, goody, goody, nom, 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 good for you. Here, and, ah, and he's eating all these little skins of the chicken McNuggets. So when I do an autopsy on a kid 12 years old who dies of leukemia, I don't put cause of death as leukemia. Well, you know, you have to have a cause of death. I always put grandma. It was grandma. Grandma's the one that gave him permission to eat the fried foods that gave him leukemia. Now, how many of you have a dog? Anybody in here have a dog? 
Okay, good. You haven't eaten them yet. <laughs> now, we've spent $100 billion over the last 60 years on dog food. We've done research on dog food for $100 billion over the last 60 years. What do we get for that? Well, we've tripled the lifespan of dogs. Six years ago, an old dog was eight years old. Today, an old dog is 25. Also, we've eliminated 900 different diseases in dogs that still plague humans. And all they want, all the dog food industry wants is the next time you get your next dog, you'll use that same dog. Wow, that dog was really good and you know, a little lucky here, lived to be 25 years old, and so I'm gonna get that same dog food. So that's why they spent the $100 billion to make sure you would continue to use their brand of dog food. Now, a couple of questions here. They make dog food for toy dogs under 10 pounds of body weight. If you've ever bought dog food, you know this. They have dog food for toy dogs under 20 pounds of body weight. They have dog food for medium-sized dogs, 35 to 50 pounds. They have dog food for large breeds between 50 and 100 pounds. They have dog food for giant breeds over 100 pounds. That's so every mouthful is perfect dosage-wise. By contrast, when you look at whether it's nutritional supplements or if it's um, uh, cough medicine or prescription drugs, there's, the age is 12. This is for somebody under age 12, this is for somebody over age 12, How, you know, adults over age 12. How many have read those? So it's on the over-the-counter stuff, yeah, it's everything. Well, I know little kids that are 12 years old, they're 300 pounds. I know 80-year-old people who are 70 pounds. So you can't go by age, you gotta go by weight, and that's why we're more successful in the animal industry, because we go by weight. So here comes the ultimate question. Well, there's two ultimate questions. If you were to ask your veterinarian, hey, can I give my dog the um, table scraps and leftovers preferentially to dog food. I mean, it's cost me a buck fifty a day to feed this, you know, 80 pound dog, and my paycheck got cut in half here, and I really want to cut back. And can I get my dog table scraps? And, and the, the veterinarian would be horrified. What? We spend $100 billion perfecting dog food, eliminate 900 different diseases, uh, triple the lifespan of your dog, and you want to feed them table scraps? I mean, the, 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 the veterinarian would be mortified. No, 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 can't do it. So here comes the ultimate question, the ultimate question. How come you eat and you feed your kids, your grandkids, food you know will kill a dog? You eat and you feed your kids, grand, grandkids, food that you know will kill a dog. So we came up with a 90 for life program in longevity. It's called 90 for Life for two reasons. Number one is the 90 essential nutrients, 16 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, three essential fatty acids. And what it means for life is for a healthy life, but it also means for life, for the length of your life. How many years do you need to take oxygen? All your life. How many years do you need to drink water? All your life. How many years do you need all 90 essential nutrients? See, these are not the optional nutrients. These are these, this is not the wax on the car. These are the things that drive the engine. So this is another look at those 90 essential nutrients. They're called essential nutrients, ladies and gentlemen, because we cannot manufacture them. We must consume them every day, either as food or supplements. Number two, if we, if we don't have them, you get horrible diseases, of which they, they will all be fatal over some period of time. Every one of these, you know, calcium deficiency causes 147 different diseases. Calcium deficiency alone causes 147 different diseases. I want you to think about that. Why would the medical profession want you to get all the calcium you need? I mean, there are people who specialize in calcium deficiency disease and they make millions of dollars every year treating your calcium deficiency with surgery. But what's in it for them if they tell you what to do for your nutrients? You can overdose taking vitamins and minerals. Don't you dare take them. Oh, my doctor says I can't take those. I can, I can overdose. They kill 1.5 million people a year from pharmaceutical decimal point problems. From pharmaceutical decimal point problems, they kill 1.5 million people a year. But that's okay, they're FDA approved. Okay, we need 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, three essential fatty acids, and our food plants can take carbon dioxide out of the air Use the sun's energy a process known as photosynthesis to manufacture long carbon chains with which the plants make vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids for themselves. And those societies that learned how to eat these plants would get these things and they live longer and healthier. We need 60 minerals. And you notice the 
number of minerals is two thirds of the 90 cents of nutrients. So minerals are very important. Well, plants only need three minerals, we need 60. Plants only need magnesium to make the leaves green to get energy from the sun. They also need phosphorus and potassium to drive growth. Everything else they need to get from the atmosphere. Nitrogen to make amino acids and protein, carbon to make every other thing they need. So if you're eating a pretty good slice of organically grown, multigrain bread, organic, baked by the pastor's wife in church on Sunday after his best sermon, you're 57 short. Bam, you're dead. But, but, but he ate so well, it was all organic and just baked with love and blue. Now, nutritional minerals do not occur in a uniform blank around the crust of the earth. They occur in veins like chocolate and chocolate ripple ice cream. Which remember that piece, it's very important. Now, how many remember going to mom and dad's house or some of you are too young for that? Uh, you might go to grandma and grandpa's house and remember that they had a wood stove. Anybody remember the wood stove days? Yeah. Now, what did grandma and grandpa do with the wood ashes every morning? Did they go in the recycling bin to save the earth? They went in the garden, exactly right, went in the garden. Well. Are wood ashes all the same? No. Remember, the plant only needs three, so that tree might have only been in a, a vein that had three minerals, but it had six, eight, 12, whatever it was, so all wood ashes were not alike. Okay, but they put them in the garden and the plants benefited. At any rate, wood ashes are not really ashes. Uh, somebody gave them that name thousands of years ago and we've kept that name, but they're really the minerals that the tree sucked up out of the ground. So it's plant minerals, AKA wood ashes. We throw them out in the garden, the okra and the tomatoes and the sweet potatoes and the onions and all the, all the uh, peas and beans and squash and corn and everything you're growing out in the garden, suck all those minerals up, you eat those plants, you get your minerals in that fashion, right? That's how the old people used to get their minerals through, through the plant minerals, AKA wood ashes going to the garden, plants suck them up, you eat the plants. Well, at three o'clock in the afternoon, Monday, September 4th, 1882, three, we know the exact moment, three o'clock in the afternoon, Monday, September 4th, 1882, Thomas Edison pulled the switch in the first commercial electric generating plant. Within 10 years, everybody in the city had converted from wood, which is inconvenient and messy for fuel, to electricity, propane, and natural gas. Now here comes the ultimate question here. How many minerals are left over? How many ashes are left over when you use electricity for fuel? Zero! And what did you replace that source of nutritional minerals with? Nothing! And that's why we're all screwed up health-wise. You gave up two-thirds of the nutrients by changing your source of fuel. And doctors say, don't you take vitamins, no, you'll overdose. And they're not FDA approved. Well, this is a cornfield from western Nebraska. I want you to look at the uniformity of those rows of corn. Look, look at the uniformity there. Every ear, every leaf, every stalk is exactly the same. Same genetic background, it's, it's a, a miracle to behold. Well, I can guarantee a couple of things just by looking at that field. I know there's at least three minerals there because you'd have empty patches there if they were missing any one of the three, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, right? So you know there's at least that. But can you, without a $2,500 analysis of each ear of corn, can you tell me which row has six minerals, which row has eight minerals, which row has 12, which row has 22? You can't tell. And so in the animal industry, we don't have insurance to pay for silly things. And so we just put everything we know that those animals need in their little alfalfa pellets. Yeah, we put the corn and the soybeans, all that stuff in their alfalfa pellets, but we also put 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, 3 essential fatty acids in there. And whatever nutrition is in the alfalfa is value added. We don't depend on it. But your I saw the out here in the auditorium or that gymnasium, you know, where they use, they, I'm sure they use it for lunchroom too. But on that far wall, there's the four food plate. It used to be the seven food, group, seven food pyramid for a long time. And the government decided everything was going bad because nobody could remember everything on the seven food pyramid. They converted to four and leveled it out into a plate. And you're supposed to eat variety and, and eat, put four different colors on your food plate and everything to be wonderful. That's the most insane approach to nutrition I've ever seen. Somebody needs to go to jail here. They kill more people than all the terrorists in the world combined every day. Now, this is a satellite photograph from 100 miles up of agricultural land in Southern California. Over here is the Pacific Ocean. Over here is Yuma, Arizona. Down here is Mexico. Up here is the Salton Sea, which gives you some sense of location. 
This is a, a salt lake, um, about one-tenth the size of the Great Salt Lake in Utah. But I want you to look at these mineral veins here. Look at those veins of minerals. Every color represents different minerals, different mixtures of minerals, uh, different amounts of each one, and so on. Uh, I remember Popeye. I remember Popeye and spinach. You're supposed to get all your iron from spinach and everything. Well, the only place I can guarantee there's going to be a lot of iron is over here because iron in the soil turns it red. I can guarantee just by looking at this photograph that there's a lot more iron over here than there is over here. But am I going to spend $2,500 on every kibble and bit <laughs> in dog food and every can of dog food and every alfalfa pellet for a laboratory rat and a cow to analyze it and make sure it has everything it needs? No. They don't do that. What they do is they put everything they know that animal needs appropriate for body weight, and then whatever's in the food is just value added. And if you're expecting iron in your food, on your sweet potatoes, your spinach, and you're getting your sweet potatoes and spinach over here, you're S out of luck. Okay? And so in the animals, they get a better deal because we put everything in that food. Now you're beginning to understand the picture. What about organic? Well, I've been saying this since I did those studies in the 1960s with the National Institutes of Health, the big multi-million dollar study I did. This is a meta-study with 240 studies. Study sees no nutritional edge in organics. Now people who grow organics and people who sell organics will lie to you. There's more nutrition in organic food, that's a lie. You need a non-organic carrot, could have 10 times more minerals in it than an organic carrot, depends on what vein in the field it grew in. The only thing you can guarantee from organic is there's no sprays on it, which is not a bad thing. That's a good thing, that's a plus. No sprays, you know, knocks your chemical load down, that's a good thing. But they want you to also believe that it guarantees nutrition, it does not. So people who eat organic still have to supplement. This is what makes young Judy unique. This is a compost pile, and this compost pile is, is made up of plants that were under the sea for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This is a 25-foot cap of um, marine limestone. It has, um, this is a compost pile. This is 3,000-foot elevation. It goes down 2,000 feet into the ground, and this is plant material. So we were able to get it certified organic every year for 35 years. It has 77 minerals in it, including the 60 essential minerals, thank you, the 60 essential minerals in optimal amounts. Nobody else has this, so this is why we're so successful with over 900 different diseases. That's the miracle stuff. Now, there's 25 different ways to get it. That's the Russian version. Okay. okay. Now, there's 25 different ways to do this, but the most, what should I say, the most easy for people to understand is the Healthy Start Pack. And this little bottle's on top of here. It fits in a, a um, kind of rectangular box. This has 245 nutrients in it, which includes 130 vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and fatty acids, including all 90 known essential ones. And then a bunch of the others that are not yet considered essential will be, but it, it's, which I say, nobody's motivated to spend lots of money to prove it because what are they gonna get for it, right? And so it's, it's not a commercial thing for the most part. And um, so at any rate, this also has 115 super juices in it. How many heard of the super juice, like noni juice, goji juice, mangosteen, acai, berry, and all kinds of, um, maki berry, you know, from um, Bolivia and so on? Well, Patagonia, that's another place they come from. At any rate, uh, this is great stuff. It has 245 nutrients, including all 90 essential nutrients in optimal amounts. And this, is, this, this one healthy start pack is designed for 100 pounds of human flesh for a month. So if you give that one pack to a 50-pound kid, that's for two months. Give it to somebody who's 90 to 110 pounds, that's for one month. If you get it to a 200-pound person, that's for two weeks. Because by body weight. That way we're more accurate, right? So we do everything in longevity by body weight because I'm a veterinarian and a physician. So I try to get as much as I can the good stuff from the veterinary industry and bring it over to people. That's why I say I treat you like a dog, which you get better. And this is, a, this is that chart that's on the wall over there. I looked at that and I said, man, that's... You're just supposed to eat fruit and vegetables and um, grains and protein and everything's gonna be fine. That's why America is sick. That's why all the jobs were shipped out of America. All the assembly jobs, all the 
and manufacturing jobs that are shipped out of America because of the high cost of medical benefits for employees. Now, how many, how many of you are old enough to remember the 1962 presidential election? Anybody remember that in here? Three or four people are old enough, okay, yeah. Well, there was a three-way race between old Bush 41, uh, Ross Perot, and Billy Clinton. Hmm? It was a three-way race. The only thing I can remember from that campaign where they all three, three were running, and they, they were only different by like three points. Billy Clinton won the presidency with 32% of the vote. Now in Europe, in England, they would have had a runoff between the top two guys. It would have been a runoff between Billy Clinton and old Bush. But Ross Perot had just about as many votes as everybody else. It was very close, kind of interesting race. But the only thing I remember from the campaign was Ross Perot was the biggest cartoon character because he has huge ears and a Texas accent. All he showed was a Texas hat and ears sticking out of it, and that was, that was Ross Perot's picture, right? Great cartoon stuff. But anyway, what he said was, if anybody signs NAFTA, you're going to hear this giant sucking sound as all the jobs leave America. Remember that, Ted? Yeah. Everybody said, that guy's an idiot. What do you mean all the jobs are going to leave America? Where are they going? Well, as soon as Billy Clinton signed NAFTA, like in his first week of president, that boy, he signed that. It was going to be the greatest thing. He gave permission for all the publicly traded corporations to leave the country and take the jobs with them. They started building infrastructures in these foreign countries. As soon as the infrastructure was built, all the jobs started going away. That's because they don't have the need or the requirement for health care benefits in those foreign countries. Now, what is a publicly traded company built for? Profit. For who? Profit for who? Sure. The shareholders, the owner of the company. Is there any law, moral or, or legislative law, requiring a publicly traded company to hire an employee? No such law. So they took all the manufacturing jobs outside of this country because nobody else has requirements for health benefits other than America. And doctors are protected monopoly. They just raise the price. Oh, we got more. We need more money. I mean, the medical costs are going up. We need more money. Medical costs are going up. Because you can't go to a second person. You can't go get a competing bid. For a roof, you go to three or four or five or six different people. You can you know, compare quality with money. You can't do that with a doctor because every doctor is going to say the same thing. The only difference between the doctors is one may kill more than another. That's it. And since there's no requirement for them to post that, you can't tell by looking at them. It's the nicest looking guy that's the one that kills the most. So this is that four food group plate. Grilled chicken breast, steamed vegetables, some berries there with some auric points, a lot of great organic rice and millet. I can guarantee you a couple of things about looking at that plate. Number one, there's four minerals in there. I can guarantee four minerals. There's some sulfur in the chicken breast because it's required for the essential amino acids. It has to have some sulfur, methionine, cysteine, cysteine. I can also guarantee there's some magnesium there because that's what makes that broccoli green, right? Everything else, all the other plant materials have magnesium, phosphorus, potassium. They might not have any magnesium here. The only magnesium in that plant may have only been in the leaves. So, but there's some magnesium here, so there's four minerals. Sulfur, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium. That's all I can guarantee. There's some beta carotene in the carrots. Um, there's some auric points, antioxidants in the berries there. Maybe some listeria in the cantaloupe. Kill you. And so the only way to guarantee you're gonna get all 90 essential nutrients is to supplement. You supplement, again, your vegetables, your proteins, your fats, which they didn't put in the other side, they, they said carbohydrates, or they said grains, what, what they said was grains, but they left out the fats piece, so I add the fats, so you'll see in a moment why, and then fruits and berries. But the only way to guarantee you're gonna get everything you need there is the 90. Not, 16 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, three essential fatty acids. You must supplement every day, like we do for dogs and, and cats and chickens and turkeys and ducks and sheep and pigs and horses and, and so on. Now, how many of you were born between 1946 and 1964? Raise your hand. <clears throat> okay, good. That's half the people in the room. Okay, you're baby boomers, and you're, you have a problem. You listen to doctors, because doctors convince you if you listen to them, you'd be the first generation where everybody lives to be 100. Houston, we have a problem. Because everything the doctors told you about health is wrong. Everything they've told you is wrong. Because it's designed to direct you towards treatment programs as opposed to cures and preventions. So about three years ago, my wife and I came up with our most recent book. We got a couple more in the pipeline here coming out for next year. But 
Three years ago, we came out with Immortality, and we looked at the top 20 longevity cultures on Earth that were written up by the National Geographic. We had 60 years worth of National Geographic looking for this stuff, right? We did this in a 10-year period, and we went to four of these cultures and countries. We went to um, uh, the internet and books and reference materials for the others. Um, and what we did was look at the agricultural departments, the anthropology departments, and looked at everything they ate, how many calories they took in, their average lifespan, all that kind of stuff, right? Now, it's interesting to me that out of the top 20 longevity cultures in not a single first world country or industrialized nation, all of the top uh, 20 uh, longevity cultures are third world cultures are illiterate. No doctors, uh, no hospitals, no clinics, no pharmacies, no private or, or government insurance. I mean, if you were to put, put a piece of paper all in a dead gymnasium out there with all the assets of each country without the name of the country, you would not go to the top 20 longevity cultures on earth because they don't have anything that you think of as being important for health. No doctors, no ambulance service, no 911. I mean, come on, man, no, no pharmaceuticals, no hospitals, no clinics. They have no, they have no utilities. That should begin to ring a bell. They have no utilities. And their, their common fuel is wood. And by dumb luck, by dumb luck, all the trees that they use for fuel grow in a place that has all 60 essential minerals. And they put those plant minerals, a.k.a. wood ash, with all 60 essential minerals in their gardens, and their okra, and their peas, and their sweet potatoes, and they eat them, and they get all the nutrients. You see, it's not technology or good genes that make them live the longest. It's that they're getting the basic raw materials to maintain themselves. And we, we give you all this information in this book. I mean, this book should be a revelation to people. Okay, it has 90 essential nutrients, and they all come from different ecosystems, islands, mountains, deserts, tropical forests. So we show you how all these different cultures get their 90 essential nutrients. They all live on a calorie-restricted diet. How many of you ever heard of the calorie-restricted diet thing? Okay, a few of you. Well, there's a, there's a science on calorie restriction where if you eat a perfect diet biochemically, you have all the vitamins and minerals and amino acids and fatty acids and optimal amount for your weight, and you cut your calories in half and maintain that perfect biochemical piece, you'll double your lifespan. There's no doubt about it. Now, these people are illiterate. They don't have any books. If you gave them a book on, on the... the Calorie-restricted diet, they just look at pretty pictures. If there's no pictures in there, they use the book for fuel, right? They, they can't read. And so why would they all be on a calorie-restricted diet? Because they're so poor, they can only afford 900 calories a day. They're hanging on by their fingernails from a calorie standpoint. Yet they work 12 hours a day, six days a week, because they have perfect source of minerals, two-thirds of their essential nutrients. Americans take in 2,800 calories to 3,200 calories, three times what these people take in, and our diet sucks. Now, they don't get any bad things. It's not that they wouldn't eat these things if they were there, if they're there. But by default, nobody's going to build a drive through for three guys on a burrow. There's no cars, no roads. And so, by default, they're not getting fried foods and processed meats with nitrates and nitrites in it, and, and they're not getting any carbonated drinks. Okay? And then they do get 20 times to 50 times the antioxidants we do. You have 20 times or 50 times the antioxidants we do. Americans take in 1,500 ORAC points. O-R-A-C is an acronym or an abbreviation for oxygen radical absorption capacity, which is a measurement of how many free radicals are being neutralized by the antioxidants in a food or a supplement. That's the U.S. Department of Agriculture measurement. And what they're doing is tracking it. They, they test how many ORAC points you take in. They say, okay, people are taking in 100,000 ORAC points every day don't get cancer. That's what they're looking for, some number like that, right? That's why they're doing that. Well, Americans take in 1,500 auric points a day, 1,500, and these third world cultures take in 20,000 to 50,000 a day. Okay, they're getting like 15 to 20 times what we take in, or more, maybe 40 times in some cases. So, um, these are things that we thought were important. Okay, now if you just take the antioxidant piece, that's 1 25th of the, of the recipe, and you'll still die at 68 to 72. Just taking a super juice, it will make you live 30 seconds longer. You need the other 24 pieces of the recipe too, particularly the two-thirds, which are the minerals, right? Let's look at billionaires. Billionaires are billionaires because they have a net worth of at least $1 billion. Now, <clears throat> Forbes magazine looked at them, and I've been after them for like 10 years. 
Is there any studies on what kills billionaires? No, 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 for years and years and years. Finally, in 2004, they came out with a study, so I take a little bit of credit for nudging them for 10 years to do that. What kills billionaires? And they say billionaires are killed by the same unglamorous things that kill everybody else. Stroke, heart attacks, diabetes, obesity, cancer, kidney failure, suicide, all the stuff that kills everybody else kills billionaires, right? The average lifespan of billionaires by 2004 was 78. Well, the average lifespan of a falling down red wine drunk in Minneapolis is 75. You don't gain a whole lot in longevity by being a billionaire. And then, I want you to think about it, there's not, as of 2004, there had never been a billionaire that lived to be 100. Now think about it. How many have ever seen these newspaper reports um, birthdays or, or, or death certificates or, or deaths of people who are 110, 120 kind of thing. Has anybody ever seen a white Harvard doctor live to be 100 in the newspaper? No. They're always a little old black lady in East Texas, in Panhandle of Florida, in Louisiana, Western, West Virginia, in the mountains someplace in the swamps of Louisiana, because they have no utilities. And by dumb luck, the trees they're using for fuel have the 60 essential minerals in it. And all the people with high technology die younger. Well, they didn't like that. So they made them redo it, and in March of 2011, they redid it. Forbes Magazine redid it in March of 2011. And they said there's still not been a billionaire lived to be 100, but the average lifespan did change. It went from 78 in 2004 to 66 in 2011. They lost 12 years of average lifespan following the doctor's instructions. Now, the peak of American longevity occurred 20 years ago and has been dropping at an ever accelerating rate since then. Women used to live 10 years longer than men. Well, now it's only three years longer than men. They're predicting within another 10 years, women and men will die at the same age on the average. Now, what's going on here? That's because baby boomers ha have depended on technology. They weren't getting the nutrition, and it's starting to show up now. Now, here's a guy, intelligent as you can get, iPod, iPad, iPhone. This guy was a genius in marketing. He was a genius in electronics and, and computers. I mean, you got to give this guy credit. But when it came to health, he was, he was an idiot. He dies at 56, 10 years before the average lifespan of the average billionaire. So what happened here? Well, when you're a billionaire, you can afford the best personal trainer, the best food, the best chef, cooks the way the doctor wants them to cook. You can get all the organics you want. I mean, you can uh, get the best health care plans. You can hire the most expensive, maybe not the best doctors, but certainly the most expensive doctors. Uh, if there's a health thing you need someplace, you can send your plane and your pilot to go get it. You can have them take you someplace. If you take out the billionaires by themselves and look at them as a separate demographic, they should be the healthiest and longest lived people in America, shouldn't they? If money meant anything for health, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, why is it he died at 56? Because he, he was a vegetarian. You know, he was a vegan. How many of you knew he was a vegan? He was a vegan. He was an unsupplemented vegan. Didn't supplement because he got the very best organic food. He was a vegan. Unsupplemented vegan, because he got the very best. And his chef made him the very best organic vegetables, stir fried and extra, 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 virgin, 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 virgin olive oil. And as a result, from all the free radicals, he got pancreatic cancer. Now here came the juncture in the road. He should have gone to the Nicoyan Peninsula in Costa Rica and Central America, because that's where the longest lived people on earth live. The people who live the longest on earth live in the Nicoyan Peninsula on the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. There's no doubt about it. They outlive everybody about 10 years. So he should have gone there and found the oldest of old persons, you know, great, 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 great grandma, and said, great, 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 great grandma, I want you to feed me like you've been eating. I want you to give me the herbs you would give somebody with really advanced cancer, and he'd still be alive today if he did. But instead, he went to the most decorated, the most heralded research cancer doctor. Bam! He was dead. As sure as they shot him in the head, they killed him. And now you know, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. Now, how many of you think that exercise is good for you? Raise your hand. 
Whether you believe it or not, how many of you heard that exercise is good? Let me rephrase it. Okay, I think everybody's heard that exercise is good for you. Well, exercise is one of the most dangerous enterprises you can be involved in. Exercise kills more Americans than terrorists. When you exercise, you sweat, don't you? When you exercise, you sweat. When you do physical work, you're throwing bales of hay, you're on a roof, roofing, you're a carpenter, you're a plumber, you're working a, in a steel mill and all the blast furnace and the heat, you're sweating, right? And people who love you want to take care of you. See, they know you're sweating and you're exercising, or you know, even Pee Wee League, you know, or Pop Warner League, all these little bitty kids out there exercising, men, women, doesn't matter, gender, age. And you say, look, honey, I want you to take plenty of what? Water so you can rehydrate, and that's what kills you. This is what kills you! Because sweat is not water. Sweat is a soup that contains all the nutrients floating around in your blood. So you're sweating out this soup. You're replacing it with water. Now that's kind of like your car's leaking a quart of oil every week. See, I'm not going to spend the $1.99 on that old clunker, so you put a quart of water in there. What's going to happen by the third or fourth week? Your engine's a big ball of flame, <laughs> burning up, right? I mean, even an idiot living under the bridge who's going to steal your car is going to check the oil before he steals it, right? Why would he risk his freedom for taking a car with no oil in it? Okay, so it's problematic. As a result, as a result, when you take all professional athletes together, all sports, the average lifespan is 62. You take football players only. This just came out two years ago. I actually have the papers if you want me to prove it. Um, the average lifespan of professional football players is 51. And with the exception of three black guys from the old Negro Baseball League days back in the 1920s, there's never been a professional athlete ever lived to be 100. There's never been a billionaire lived to be 100. So all, you th all the things that you think of as being important for health and longevity aren't, aren't real. I, I speak for hours on, on athletics. Uh, I deal with professional teams and Olympic teams and so on. Let me just show you this. You've all heard of ACL injuries and cartilage injuries and tendon injuries and muscle things. These guys get $10 million a game, and this is what happens to them. I mean, they're supposed to be the fit of the fittest. They're drinking water or Gatorade. If they're drinking Gatorade, they're 88 shard. If they're drinking water, they're 100 shard, 90 shard. I want you to look at my left hand. My left hand is the nutritional reserves in the body. And here you are, you're sweating, working out, whatever you're doing, you're sweating, and you're drinking water. What's happening to your nutritional reserves? They're going down because you're replacing soup with water, right? You reach a point at which your tendons can't maintain themselves and they break down. You go a little farther, your cartilage starts shredding. Go a little farther, you get diabetes and heart disease. Go a little farther, bam, you're dead. And now again, you know the rest of the story. I love water, we sell water, but I put a lot of things in it. <laughs> Here's a guy who wanted to be a professional quarterback. Had three ACL injuries in his knee. How many knees does this guy have? Elizabeth Taylor had seven hip replacements. How many hips did Elizabeth Taylor have? You see, there's no law requiring a doctor to cure you. As long as you'll accept treatment, you have good insurance. Well, insurance pay for it. Go ahead, doc. So, to make a long story short, because of all the athletes we work with, we came out with a, oh, I should tell you one other piece, and that is each year, according to the Center for Disease Control, 75,000, 100,000 young people in America, 75,000, 100,000 young people in America die each year while they're exercising under age of 30. Now, wait a minute, it's supposed to be good for you. Yeah, right. Who told you that? The doctors told you exercise is good for you. Don't take any vitamins and minerals. Drink plenty of water. Hmm. And so we came up with a sports drink called Rebound. It has 100 nutrients in it. So if you have somebody you love who's sweating in their labor or, or because they play sports, you need to get them on the Rebound. It has 100 nutrients in it. Let's look at doctors. U.S. News will report February 5th, or excuse me, February 2005. Um, U.S. News will report rated America's most credible print news source. Special health issue. Who needs doctors? Your future physician might not be a medical doctor. You may be better off. Now, do you think that every MD in Apple Valley made sure this was in their waiting room when that came out? Uh, I don't think so. 
I think probably they sent out the Boy Scout troop there that they said, we'll give you a thousand bucks. Just go collect all those magazines out of every store and shred them. Buy a lot of tents. Now, why did they do that? Well, they did that because they backed the doctors against the HMOs in the 1990s. How many remember that great battle between the HMOs and the doctors? The doctor said, we're the doctor here. We're supposed to be the ones to decide what treatment you get. Why would you want an accountant and an HMO deciding what treatment you get? That's because the accountant at the HMO knew the HMO could only be profit profitable if they cured you. They were going for the cure, and the doctors wanted to treat you for 25 years. And everybody went with the doctor. Everybody went with the doctor. You'd have been better off going with the HMOs, because they wanted to cure you. The doctor didn't like that. Well, in my original audio cassette tape, April of 1993, I said, it was a study based on a database of 200 doctors. I just grabbed a handful of, of uh, Journal of the American Medical Association on the medical library, added up the age of death of 200 doctors, divided by 200, and I got 58. And why would you want to go to, in this audio cassette tape, why, why would you want to go to a group of people whose average lifespan is 58 to learn how to live to be 100 in a healthy way? It didn't, didn't make sense to me. Well, they didn't like that, so they did their own study, and they said, well, Wallach lied. The average lifespan of a, of a um, um, family doctor or primary care physician is not 58 like Wallach claims, it's 56. Now some of you will get the math pretty quick here. I said 58, they said 56. They were so eager to show that my statistics were wrong that they failed to appreciate that they're telling people that they died two years earlier than I said. So I do apologize for giving them too, too many years. <laughs> so the information is still the same. Why would you go to a group of people whose average lifespan is 56 to learn how to live to be 100. This fellow here, Socrates, a, a great international soccer player, is also a cardiologist. He was a, he was a cardiologist. My wife loved this guy just because he's a good-looking young man. My wife's 70 years old, and she said, I'm a cougar. <laughs> so she thought, this cute guy, you know, she thought, he's just so cute. And I said, but honey, he's dead. Because he only drank water. I'm going to show you my favorite obituary. My favorite obituary is George Francis. Died at 112. He was the oldest man in America in December of 2008. He was an illiterate black fellow from the swamps, Louisiana, so you already know where I'm going. Um, never went to kindergarten. As his daughter reading the newspaper to him, couldn't read. Never had a job where he got a paycheck with deductions in it. And so he, he um, never had any Social Security, never had any Medicare and Medicaid, never went to a doctor using grandma's herbs. He used wood for fuel, had a still, drank a lot of white lightning, rolled his own cigarettes, that kind of stuff. Ate crawdads and you know, fried catfish and sweet potatoes and onions, ate peppers like the Creoles. And he dies at 112 as the oldest man in America. <clears throat> now, th these guys who did this obituary were very smart. He, they said he, he lived through 19 US presidents whose average lifespan is 75. Average lifespan of the U.S. president is 75 when you take out Jack Kennedy, assassinated 40 something, right? And they have at least one university degree, unless they're a lawyer, they have two. They're cared for by medical doctors who have at least one university, well, they actually have two university degrees, an undergraduate degree and a medical degree, and then if they're a specialist like me, they have three, four degrees. Okay? <clears throat> and the average lifespan of the medical doctors, by their own statistics, who care for these presidents is 56, exactly half of George's age. So I want to know what George knew, right? <clears throat> so when he died, these authors asked his daughter, what did your daddy do to live to be 112? And she said he, he broke all the rules of healthy eating. Well, who came up with the rules of healthy eating? Medical doctors who lived to be 56. <laughs> Says he broke all the rules of healthy eating with a diet heavy on dairy, eggs, and large sandwiches, nothing but cholesterol and saturated fat. <laughs> hoo -ah! Now, we laugh at that, but there's a message here. There's a message here. It's part of that book, Immortality. When you see what these people eat, you blow your mind. Just the opposite of what doctors say is good for you. And so, why did he live to be 112 by eating eggs, dairy, and lard sandwiches? Because cholesterol and saturated fat is not bad. Remember I told you everything doctors told you about health is wrong? And you're going to see why in a minute. You're going to be angry, angry, angry at the medical group. Okay. This gal here, Cradella Evans, 
the little black lady, came to us, and this is Bob and Judy Bell, some of our distributors in Crockett, Texas, just uh, outside of uh, Houston. And they sponsored this gal 15 years ago, and she was uh, 85 years old, and uh, she had like six disease. She had high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis, uh, macular degeneration, she had a little dementia. And we changed her diet, and we got her on the 90 essential nutrients, appropriate for her body weight, and 15 years later, Ju uh, July 8th of this year, she turns 100. She has a very large longevity business. She's got over 300 people in her little marketing group, more than pays for her supplements. She has a lot of money left over, so she goes and does all these activities all over the place. And she, to me, she looks like she's maybe 75, 80 years old. She doesn't look like she's 100. That's her, she doesn't color her hair. I just thought it was really you know, brilliant. We're starting to get more and more people like her. We're accumulating quite a few people, and we might want to do a, a story on her about this. Okay, really super stuff. The last one I'm going to show you here before we get to the individual disease, I'm going to go very fast in the individual disease. So get out your pens and paper. You'll get most of it here. The last one I'm going to show you before I get to the diseases is this one. This is the oldest person we know on earth. Now, there's probably th people who are older than her, but we don't know about them. This gal was born in 1853 in a little island in Indonesia with no utilities. Wood was her fuel. Okay. And we know she was born then because we, we can see the birth certificates and the baptismal records at the Dutch Reformed Church in the little island she was born in. Now, in June of 2010, she was 157. She's still alive today, so she's 159. No doctors on that island. And since this is a fairly academic group, I'm going to throw this one in here, which I don't often, but it's really a great story. When Linus Pauling got his first of two Nobel Prizes, the first Nobel Prize he got was for studying the nutrition of genes. Genes require nutrients to function. You take a gene, you throw it in a bucket of saline water, and say, okay, gene, you're a good gene, go for it, make something, make a protein. Gene just sits there like tar baby. Gene can't do nothing without nutrients. Needs raw material like a factory, right? You need raw materials, you need energy, you need employees, you need parts, and all this stuff. Well, genes are the same way. Their genes are just a blueprint. Uh-oh. What did the genome do for us after we spent a trillion dollars? Nothing! After 20 years of mapping out the genome, they still haven't cured the cold. They haven't cured anything. Because genes by themselves do nothing. They require 90 essential nutrients, too. Ha <laughs> ha. Interesting. This new science is called epigenetics. How many of you heard of the term epigenetics? Okay, a few of you, good. Now I've been involved in this for a long time. And this is where it's at, because genes will not work without nutrition. And what he said when he received his first Nobel Prize for doing research into the nutrition of genes and chromosomes and enzymes, he said, you can trace every sickness, every disease, and every ailment to a mineral deficiency. Whoa, that's heavy, that is heavy. Do you think the medical system liked him? No. They actually took, he should have got a third Nobel Prize because he was the one that first proposed that the double helix was how the chromosomes and genes were laid out. He proposed it. He figured it out 20 years before Watson and Crick got their Nobel Prize for it. And they got their idea by reading his stuff. And he was cheated. He should have shared that Nobel Prize with them. But they took his passport away from him because the doctors insisted he was a communist. And he couldn't go to Europe and study the gal by the name of Franklin, who was doing all the uh, x-ray stuff uh, to determine the double helix. And they didn't have email back then. OK, now here we go. Get your pencil and paper out. We're going to run through about six or eight of the main diseases very quickly here. This is going to be a revelation for you. And I can go fast, because now you know more than doctors. You've now become the most dangerous people in America. Let's see, we have, what, about 60 or so people in here, and 57 people signed the Declaration of Independence and started the revolution against England, changed the world, those 57 people. Now they, they committed their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor, those 57 people. It doesn't take much to win this battle, but we're going to have to be proactive. We can't hope and pray that the doctors are going to be the good guys here. We can't hope and pray. Let's 
You see, I can tell by looking at you, but just for just to show of hands, how many of you ladies are still in the childbearing years? Okay, a good third of you, any rate, maybe two thirds of the women here in the room. So I want to spend two minutes on birth defects. <clears throat> Every birth defect you can name me, and ten times that many you can't, are all caused by nutritional deficiencies of the embryo. There's not a single genetic birth defect. We've eliminated all birth defects in animals by simply giving the females preconception nutrition, perfect preconception nutrition prior to conception. Because all we had to do was give them good nutrition before they conceive, we eliminate all birth defects. I've been doing that in humans for 35 years. Okay? It works like a charm. All the diseases you think of are genetic in humans or not, they're just deficiencies of the embryo. Now why would, do you know how many, how many different specialties we'd wipe out if there wasn't another baby born with a birth defect? Oh my gosh. All these kids with special needs. All these different agencies raising money to find research for the cure. Ooh. We're going to look quickly at obesity because we're the number one obese nation in the world. Why are we the number one obese nation in the world? Because doctors and the government has no idea what causes it. And I'm here to tell you, we actually have a book out there called um, Hell's Kitchen. The subtitle is The Cause, Prevention, and Cure of Obesity. Nobody else can claim that they know that. Because if they did, we would be the number one obese nation in the world. Okay? So, it's not a disease of excess. Uh, the reason why we're in such trouble with, with obesity is it's not a disease of excess, and that's how the government and the doctors treat us. It. It's a disease of excess. You need more exercise. You need, you need less. But that's not what the problem is. It's a nutritional deficiency disease. Not a calorie deficiency, but a nutrition deficiency. And I'll show you that. I'll prove that to you in a second. Just show you that for remembrance, right? Remember that one. Now, according to experts, 70% of our kids under the age of 12 are overweight, and 40% of our kids under the age of 12 are obese, which is 30 pounds over their ideal weight for their height. And it has nothing to do with too much scream time, lack of exercise, or eating too much. It has nothing to do with any of that. It's a simple nutritional deficiency. But you see, doctors would rather give you a bone marrow transplant when you have iron deficiency anemia than iron. Do you understand? Well, we've got the technology. We've got to use the technology. Let's do lap banding. That'll fix it. Now, this is one of my favorite obesity slides. This looks at obesity in adults. In 1980, we only had 15% Americans obese. Between 1900 and 1980, it was like 12%, 15%, 12%, 15%. It never really rose above 15% for 80 years. Boy, in here, it just started going up like crazy. By 2000, 20 years later, it, it doubled, more than doubled. What happened? Well, right here, they took all the fat out of our diet. It's hard to find fat. I mean, everything is no fat, low fat, or fat free. And we're getting fat. Then, anybody here ever raised livestock? Anybody fatten cattle or sheep or pigs? Now, do you feed them ice cream and lard and eggs to fatten them up? Do you feed them whole grains to fatten them up classically? And the answer is yes. You feed them whole grains. 99% of farmers feed their cattle and pigs and sheep and chickens whole grains to fatten them up. Now wait a minute, didn't they tell you to eat whole grains? Huh, let's have a look at that. Now you see, this is what you're getting following the doctor's instructions, no fat and eating whole grains, exercising. <coughs> now if the doctors were correct, the chart should look like that. If the government was correct, the chart should look like that. But following their directions for 20 plus 12 years is 32 years. Uh-oh, Houston, we have a problem here. Now, one of my favorite obesity slides is that, that of Rosalie Bradford. She had two Guinness World Book of Records for obesity. Number one, she's the heaviest woman ever officially weighed by the, uh, by the uh, Guinness World Book of Records. She weighed 1,242 pounds, 1,242 pounds. You went on two dates with Rosalie, you had a ton of fun. Do the math. <laughs> now, she also had her second Guinness World Book record. She lost the most weight, 736 pounds, between 1987 and 1994. This is not lose 10, gain 5, lose 10, gain 5 kind of thing. This is lose, 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 because they did a lap banding on her, and they put on a 500-calorie diet, and she, over those years, she lost 736 pounds. That's like three people. Okay, and then she died because fat is not the problem. Fat is just a symptom, just like cholesterol is not the problem. 
Now, what does it tell you? In 1980, it was 15%. It's almost gone up 300%. So what's the problem here? That's because they've told you to get fat. Eat whole grains, exercise, don't take vitamins and minerals. Avoid fat, and you get fat. I mean, if you're not careful, you could wind up in Ruth Chris Steakhouse as the meal instead of, instead of the, the eater. No end in sight for the obesity epidemic. Why is that? Because there's 80 million baby boomers come along who eat whole grains, exercise, and don't take vitamins and minerals. I'm gonna give you three clues, and then I'm gonna give you the answer. Don't forget the book, Hell's Kitchen. This gal here, Natalie Hayhurst from Terre Haute, Indiana, was driven to eat light bulbs. Now, they say it's a rare condition, but it's not a rare condition. This happens several million times a day in America. She prefers wood, paper products, cardboard, sticks. She likes rocks, dirt, she eats Diet Coke cans. She won't eat classic Coke cans, only Diet Coke cans. Um, she's eaten little magnets out of shower curtains. She loves plastic bottles and toys. I think that's why McDonald's took the toy out of the Happy Meal. So what, what is this condition? Well, you can call it pica, the munchies. You can call it, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. But, but she has a condition because she's minerally deficient. Pregnant women get the same thing. They eat weird stuff. I mean, women, pr pregnant women are classic for eating weird stuff. You know, back when your grandmother was out living out in the rural areas, she had pregnancy, she went out and eat dirt. Fortunately, there was no calories in dirt, right? How many well, ladies heard your grandma used to eat dirt when she was pregnant? Yeah, I mean, grandma used to do that. We live in the 17th floor of an apartment building now in the inner city where there's no trees even. You start eating the Tootsie Rolls out of the kitty litter box because you're, you're hungry for weird stuff when you're merely deficient. If you own a cat with a kitty litter box, you know what I'm talking about. So I want you to get the book, Hell's Kitchen, because that's going to give you the details of when and how and gives you the whole story of, of the electricity and how it made us fat. Loyola School of Medicine, Chicago. Oh, that's the Russian version again. Exercise won't cure obesity because when you exercise, you're sweating, you're replacing your sweat with water, you're sweating out of your minerals, and guess what? You get hungrier. If you're skinny, you stay skinny. If you're fat, you get fatter when you exercise. As a result, when they looked at that data, everybody agreed that they were correct. So it was a cover article in August of 2009, eight months later, the myth about exercise, it won't make you lose weight. Anybody here ever raise horses or work with horses? Raise your hand. Okay, if you, what do you call when a horse chews on the fence? Cribbing. cribbing, very good. And how do you get rid of cribbing in a horse? You can shoot him in the head, that'll stop it, but I mean, what else can you do to get a horse to stop cribbing? Salt. What? Salt. Yeah, you give them a trace metal salt block, or you give them bone meal or some minerals, and they'll stop within three to five days, they'll stop chewing on the fence. Well, those of you who have never seen cribbing, this is a stall in a barn in a horse and buggy Amish farm in Switzerland County, uh, Indiana, in the southeastern corner of Indiana. And I don't even need to look at the horse or do tests on him. I just look at the rails in that stall in the barn. I can see that that horse is merely deficient. Now, it's called cribbing in animals. It's called the munchies in humans. Now, it's, it's, it's socially unacceptable. It's socially unacceptable for your little kids to eat the neighbor's furniture when you visit. <laughs> and that's where we developed the custom that's where we developed the custom of taking and giving them cookies and, and drinks. They all have calories in it, so, they... <laughs> so we came up with a program that works every time. Obviously, you have to take the 90 essential nutrients for body weight, one healthy start pack for 100 pounds of body weight per month. And then if you're a diabetic, we like you to throw in, and you don't have to be a diabetic, but certainly a diabetic. You could also throw this in if you're not a diabetic. The um, Slender FX weight management system. It has some um, gluten-free, water-soluble fiber, so you feel satiated. It's got a meal replacer. You can either make it into a cold shake or an ice cream. You make it with water, and uh, it has 80 calories and no sugar in it. Great for diabetics. Also has some accelerators here to speed up the weight loss. <coughs> but the real secret sauce for weight loss is this one. ASAP, put a dropper full of this under your tongue 30 minutes before each meal, and this replaces the HCG diet. How many of you heard of the HCG diet? Okay. That requires injections. You've got to do this whole thing with the doctor, right? Prescription stuff. Well, this is the raw material for your body to make your own HCG. You put this under your tongue, 
30 minutes before each meal, and you will lose weight and keep it off. ASAP, ASAP, as slim as possible, as soon as possible. I'll show you two examples, one boy, one girl. This is Jerry from Salt Lake City. He'd been with us for 12 years at this point, and he had a bread belly. Now, he'd been taking the 90 cents of nutrients, didn't have any health problems, but he had a bread belly. How many of you heard of a beer belly? Raise your hand, okay, sure. Well, a good German knows that beer is liquid bread. Every German knows that beer is liquid bread. Why? Because the ingredients in beer and the ingredients in bread are exactly the same. The only difference between bread and beer is one is fermented and the other one is baked. The same ingredients. Same ingredients, only bakers and fermentation is just difference in preparation, it's the same stuff. So it shouldn't be too hard for you to understand how somebody who eats bread can get a bread belly, just like people who drink beer get a beer belly. All right? So all we added to his program, he's been, he took two healthy start packs, he drank the rebound, because he's a little bit of a farmer. His wife, Judy, loved to make bread. He had bread for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and bedtime snack. Make his wife happy. Support his wife's hobby of making bread, organically grown, multigrain, you know the drill. So we added the um, ASAP. 45 days, he loses 50 pounds, primarily from his belly, okay? Because this product will preferentially move your your uh, metabolism to preferentially burn belly fat. And you can do crunches, you can do all that kind of stuff, you can lose 50 pounds, you'll lose muscle before you lose belly fat. I see a lot of people shaking their heads, yes, right? If you've ever tried to lose belly fat, it's very difficult. But this stuff will do it. Now I'll show you another one here. You already know this person, the little red-headed gal, Brandy, who introduced me. She's five foot two, and in this picture, she weighed 158 pounds. One third of her body weight was fat. Okay, I apologize for this being out of focus, but this came off of her driver's license with a, a phone camera. At any rate, um, so she'd been with us for about eight years at this point, uh, we, and she'd been using our products. So her husband is a heavy equipment driver, and uh, he liked bread, so she made bread for him, and what was ever left over, she'd eat it, right? Rather than let it go away, she ate it. And so we put her on the rebound, because she was drinking two liters of Pepsi a day, only five foot two, two liters of Pepsi a day. And so we put her on rebound instead of the, the um, Pepsi. And then she lost, I don't know, 20 something pounds and she still needed to lose another 30. So she got on the ASAP and in a month's time she got down to 106 pounds, 158 to 106. Healthy start pack, rebound and ASAP. Now, that was, I think she got down to this 106 pounds in January of this year. She's still 106 pounds. You will keep your weight off as long as you're taking in the minerals appropriate for your body weight because you don't have the munchies anymore. Everybody else, you can lose weight. There's a million different ways to lose weight, but you always gain it back because you haven't solved the problem of mineral deficiency. You get the picture? Okay, now I can move on here. Oh, also I should do this one here. I forgot, Tim's here. One of the guys who helped register tonight, Tim, he lost 44 and a half pounds and eight inches in waist in just 60 days on the program. He'd been with us for a while, but the SAP, and he's been able to keep it off. And he was telling me he was hiking up in the mountains, and because he lost that uh, 45 pounds, he did pretty good. Okay, how many of you ever heard of Alzheimer's disease? Raise your hand. Okay, Alzheimer's disease is a physician-caused disease. <clears throat> Alzheimer's disease is a physician caused disease. Didn't exist 40 years ago, even by another name. Today it's the number four cause of death in Americans over the age of 65. So it goes from zero 40 years ago, but now it's the number four cause of death. That's caused by physicians, I'll tell you how. <clears throat> what is Alzheimer's disease? Well, Alzheimer's disease is a going away of the myelin, it's the white matter of the brain. How many of you heard of myelin? Most of you younger people should know myelin. It's the white matter of the brain, insulation material. And when it goes away, the naked nerve fibers all tangle up. It's one of the diagnostic features of Alzheimer's disease at autopsy. You get these nerve tangles. You've probably all read about nerve tangles. And um, uh, this is caused by the myelin going away. Well, myelin makes up 75% of your brain weight. The gray matter of your brain, the thinking part, the memory part, the problem solving part of your brain, it only makes up 2% of your brain weight. It's like two millimeters of this little covering of the white matter. The white matter makes up 75% of your brain weight. Well, this 
myelin, this white matter of the brain that makes up 75% of your brain weight, is 100% cholesterol. So you go on a cholesterol-restricted diet, you take cholesterol-lowering drugs, bam, you have Alzheimer's disease. Because you can't maintain the white matter in your brain anymore. You're giving up all the raw materials, you're taking drugs to drive your cholesterol down because doctors said it would make you live longer. Let's have a look. Alzheimer's, tidal wave feared. Why is that? There's 80 million baby boomers coming along. They all listen to doctors, lower their cholesterol with diet and drugs. This came out in 2009. Alzheimer's and a relentless upper trigger. It kind of reminds me of that obesity chart. Probably the doctor's instructions is going this way. Why? Because numbers look particularly grim for baby boomers who follow the doctor's instructions. Exercise, drink plenty of water, don't eat fat, eat plenty of whole grains. Oh yeah, use oils instead of lard and dairy and eggs, like George Francis. Oh, you're going to see a lot of this kind of stuff now. A mother and son share the bonds of love, Alzheimer's disease, and the same doctor who lowered their cholesterol. Now, any Mormons in here tonight? Any Mormons? Any Mormons? Any Mormons? Oh, I'm disappointed. No Mormons. Okay. Um, any Seventh-day Adventists? Any? Okay. Now, the reason why I'm asking that question is 2004, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine came out with a wonderful study on Alzheimer's disease. They went to Cache County, Utah. And they chose Cache County, Utah. I mean, you could get 5,000 people for a study in Baltimore, Maryland, right? So why did they go all the way out to Cache County, Utah? Well, that's because in Cache County, Utah, they're extremely religious Mormons. They're almost like Orthodox Jewish people when it comes to their diet. Um, they actually have a, <clears throat> um, a book uh, called The Words of Wisdom, which supplements the Book of Mormon, and it tells them what to eat, what not to eat, right? And so all of these people in Cache County, Utah, the oldest living people in America, they live to be 87. Seventh-day Adventists live to be 85. The Mormons as a group live to be 85, but the, the Mormons in Cache County, Utah live to be 87. They're all farmers, very religious farmers, with a background from Scotland. They all come just, you know, all their culture comes from Scotland. So culture, the same, same genetic pool, same diet, the same profession, live in the same county, same everything. Same diet, it was, it was really a great study. I mean, it was like laboratory rats, right? It was just perfect. And what they do is take 5,000 of these people over the age of 65, they gave half of them a couple of vitamins, and the other half they gave a sugar pill. It was a blind study, nobody knew who was getting what. Well, at the end of the study, those getting the vitamins reduced their risk of Alzheimer's disease by 78%. Those getting the sugar pill increased their Alzheimer's disease risk by 78%. But you have to remember, the diet was the basic thing, okay? Now, in the animal industry, we give them the perfect diet, very similar to the Mormon diet and the Jewish diet and the Seventh-day Adventist diet, but we also add all 90 essential nutrients. We eliminate Alzheimer's disease in animals by 100%. So now you know Alzheimer's disease is not genetic. There's no way it could be genetic if you can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 78% just by taking a couple of vitamins and a particular diet. It's not genetic in any way, shape, or form. Again, doctors are wrong because their knowledge is very constricted. They have a very narrow range of training. They, they know little or nothing. Every time they utter the word nutrition or give you nutritional advice, they should be put in jail as a felon. That would stop them from killing people. If they say the first two letters of the word nutrition, they should be put in jail. You're in jail, put the cuffs on them. Now I'll give you an example. This is Ray McGregor from Charlotte, North Carolina. <clears throat> His sister, who's one of our associates, one of our distributors, Three years ago called me and said her brother eight years earlier had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Very severe, very rapidly advancing. The doctors tried all these drugs that they say they can help with dementia, no help. So she took him over the eight year period before she called me to three neurological clinics and then she took him to the medical school two weeks before she called me and <clears throat> went to the Department of Neurology at the medical school there in, in North Carolina and said, look, I want the, I'm demanding that the head of the department of neurology examine my brother, which he did. He said, look, this guy, he's sitting, he's curled up on the floor. He's being fed through a G tube. There's nothing we can do. Drugs aren't going to help. Love's not going to help. Money's not going to help. Put him in a hospice. If you're going to do that, put him in the one that I own, right? 
Oh, he didn't say that, but I just threw that in. Put him in a house is what he said. <clears throat> so she calls me. So there's four different dementias. There's vascular dementia, which used to be called senile dementia. There's nothing wrong with your brain when you have senile dementia or vascular dementia. It's actually a plugging of the arteries in your brain, just like you get coronary arteries that plug. They can plug here, can plug there, right? And then there's Korsakoff syndrome, which is a deficiency of a single vitamin. It was discovered 300 years ago, set in the year 1712 by a Japanese naval surgeon. And then there's Wernicke Korsakoff's, which is Korsakoff syndrome, that deficiency of that vitamin and MS, multiple sclerosis, mixed in together. And then there's Alzheimer's disease. So here's what I told her to do. I said, look, we're going to treat him for all four. And I do this literally a thousand times a year. It always works out. So we're going to try this on your brother, too. We gave him the two healthy start packs. He weighed 185 pounds, so we gave him two healthy start packs. Got him off all the bad stuff. No fried foods, no oils, which is difficult because what are they feeding him through his G-tube? Insure, which is all carn oil. It's easy to get through the tube and you can count the calories, and that's why they made it out of carn oil. They don't consider what it does for the patient or what it does to the patient, right? Insure is the worst. I wouldn't give insure to a communist, okay? It's bad stuff. So two healthy start packs per month, none of the bad stuff. Now, for the vascular dementia, I threw in three twice a day of the ultimate daily tablets, which are designed to get blood flow through blood arteries and support healthy blood pressure and so on. Then, for the Korsakoff syndrome, I gave him three de-stress capsules twice a day. It's two bottles a month. It has the vitamins in it that are missing when you have Korsakoff syndrome. And then, for Wernicke Korsakoff's, I added selenium to it, three of those twice a day. It's two bottles a month to deal with the lesions of the MS, which are, you can get rid of those, and MS goes away. And then for the Alzheimer's disease, I threw in 12 eggs a day, three build the myelin of the brain, because the cholesterol's gone in his brain, so I've got to get his, ramp up his cholesterol, give him 12 eggs a day, and three of our, what we call Smart FX, three times a day, that's three bottles a month. Ultimate daily tablets, and then the last one is Smart FX, three of those, you know, like, get smart, okay? Uh, three of those three times a day, three bottles a month, and that's the raw materials for your brain to make the neurotransmitters for memory. Duh. So she calls me in two weeks. I'm going to give you an exact quote of what she called me. Actually, it was a week. Okay, I'm going to give you the exact quote. She calls me on the radio, so I have the disc. I'm even going to quote the utterances she made. She calls me in two weeks, and she says, He's cured! Ha, ha, he's cured! Now, Ray and his wife love me because he was that close to death, put him in a hospice, he'd have been dead in two weeks. Okay? Now, he didn't have Alzheimer's disease like all those doctors said. He had Korsakoff syndrome, which is curable in two weeks by giving him the vitamin. Remember, I hedged my bet and I treated him for all four, and it paid off for Ray. I do this a thousand times a year, maybe more than that, and I don't even know it. But those are the ones I know about. I do have to tell you that sugar aggravates the deficiency of that vitamin. Sugar aggravates the deficiency of vitamin, so I thought this was kind of profound. And this came out um, in February of 2012, this year. High calories from sugar linked to mild memory loss in elderly. If you're deficient in that vitamin, you're taking lots of sugar, juices and fruit and molasses and honey and agave syrup and soft drinks and desserts and candy bars, guess what, pie, and all you. you're going to get dementia. But it's not Alzheimer's disease. It's this Korsakoff syndrome or Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome. Sugar and oil is the worst possible thing you can give to anybody with a brain problem, particularly the elderly, right? The same formula works also on Parkinson's disease, MS, multiple sclerosis, as I already mentioned, and also Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. Thousands of these people a year were able to reverse from their disease. It usually takes 60, 90 days. I'm very famous in Western Canada for this. Some very wealthy guys had Parkinson's disease, and we went back there three months after we got them going. Their wives were very, I mean, they made them stick to the thing. They ground up everything, put it with a turkey basing syringe through their G tubes. Went back in three months. One of them is, uh, he comes to all our meetings, and he's a very wealthy guy, and had put all his employees on our program. His name is David Dietrich. He had all these patents for quick release and quick coupling tractor equipment. And he comes up to me and says, Hi, Doc. Uh, I really don't remember you, but, but you're the guy that saved me. I, I'm the one that used to have Parkinson's disease. And, and he was a vegetable when I first met him. <laughs> and now he's perfectly healthy in just three months. And he'd been getting worse and worse and worse for 12 years. 
You're very dangerous now, because now you know. Okay, arthritis, 98% of all arthritis is a simple mineral deficiency disease. Only 2% of arthritis is rheumatoid arthritis caused by an infection that's curable in two weeks. You can cure rheumatoid arthritis in two weeks with, a, with a antibiotics. We've known that for 70 years. But see, there's no law requiring doctors to cure you, so how do they treat you? Let's see here, they give you prednisone cortisone, they give you methotrexate, they give you gold shots, they do joint replacements, $750,000. Why should they take $300 in office calls? See, now you've become very dangerous now because now you know the truth. 85% of the people with rheumatoid arthritis also have bone-to-bone -bone arthritis. <clears throat> so you still, even with rheumatoid arthritis, even though it's an infection, when it's advanced, they're all gnarled up, even people like that. Within a year, we can get them playing concert piano. We've done it hundreds of times. You know, they're all gnarled up. No surgeries, no joint, I mean, just, just within a year, they repair. It's an amazing thing, okay? You give them the healthy bone and joint pack, you throw in what we call the, the um, killer biotic, kind of like Geraldine's boyfriend, killer. Some of you may recognize this fellow, Andy Young from the old civil rights movement. This is 1991, I was a little porkier back then. She had about 60 pounds since then. But Andy was um, scheduled to get a double knee replacement because he had bone to bone arthritis, 1991. Athletes told him about me, so he called me and said, can you help me? I said, yeah, and he canceled his double knee replacement surgeries. And that was uh, 21 years ago. He's never had to have any joint surgery, and he's perfectly healthy now in his 80s. He can outrun an 18-year-old and swims five miles a day. He's been on my program for 21 years. The coming ep epidemic of arthritis. Why is there a coming epidemic of arthritis? That's because there's 80 million baby boomers all who listen to the doctors. Exercise is good for you. Drink plenty of water. Do not take any vitamins, minerals. You can overdose. <laughs> now, do you think they did that just because they were stupid? and because they were protecting their trophy wife's lifestyle. Hmm. This came out in September 2000, uh, 2012. Soaring knee surgeries put a strain on costs. Why is that? Because there's 80 million baby boomers come along, and they all want knee surgeries because the doctors and insurance pay for it. Why would I want to pay $4 a day to rebuild my knee when insurance pays for surgery? Because when you do surgery on your right knee, what does that do for the other 71 joints in your body? Nothing! You take the healthy bone and joint pack, it supports and promotes maintenance and repair of all of them. Well, I better ask my doctor. I get that a lot. I better ask my doctor. You better hurry. He's 75 years and 11 and a half months old. He's only got two weeks left. <laughs> do not take those drugs, bisphosphates, Fosamax, and uh, Boniva, they only r reduce the rate of loss of brittle old bone. They do not build new bone, as doctors told you. That's why it's now 1-800-BAD-DRUG. Harvard Medical School, New England Journal of Medicine, 10 years ago, 2002. New England Journal of Medicine. They did a meta-study on 300,000 people that had joint replacement surgeries, knees, hips, shoulders. They just, the reporters just used knee surgery because everybody knows about knee surgery. Knee surgery, AKA all joint surgeries, for arthritis are worthless. That's Harvard Medical School and the New England Journal of Medicine 10 years ago. But you go to any orthopedic surgeon, you say, oh, I've got bone to bone arthritis, both knees, and all these other doctors want to do joint replacements. Well, I'll do a better job and give you a 10% discount. Do any of them say, hey, let's try the healthy bone and joint pack for 90 days here? <laughs> then we'll decide about surgery? No, 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 no. So what I want you to do is, is give longevity, give me 90 days. Do the healthy bone and joint pack. If you have any joint problems, I have to tell you, I'm 73 years old. I've been doing this for 64 years. I started when I was nine. I started taking, not the healthy bone and joint pack the way it is, but the 90 essential nutrients twice a day. She says I was nine years old. Read the book, Dead Dodgers and Lie. It tells you the story how I figured it out when I was nine. I figured I had a little help, right? No nine-year-old is going to figure it out then, so I must have had some help. But think about it. I haven't been sick one day in 64 years. People know me for a long time. I've never been sick in 64 years. I've never been on a prescription medication, never. I can still get another eight hours of lecture on one foot if I can balance myself here. I mean, there's not many 73-year-old guys who can do that because they have arthritis and pain in their feet and their backs and all this kind of stuff. And so it has nothing to do with age. It has to do with everything. You're giving your body all the raw materials it needs to maintain itself. You put it all in your car, you change the oil every 3,000 miles, like the maintenance book says. 
that car will last 300,000 miles. You don't change the oil and you don't replace it as it's burning up, <laughs> you might only go 50,000 miles, right? So, give me 90 days. If I fail, you can always get the surgery. If you go get the surgery first, you can't always get unsurgery, uninfected, unparalyzed, and undead. <clears throat> Four years later, the same group of doctors, same database, looked at back surgery, low back pain, sciatica, um, restless leg syndrome, peripheral neuropathies, numbness, burning, tingling in your neck and feet and hands and so forth, uh, degenerative disc disease, surgery unnecessary for sciatica and low back pain, low back problems. Give me 90 days. If I fail you with a healthy bone and joint pack, you can always Right? You can always go get the surgery, but you don't want to go get surgery first because of all the terrible things that they do to patients for back surgery. That's the worst. I see people all the time. They're all neural. Oh, yeah, they put two rods in my back 14 years ago, and I'm doing fine now. Everything's good. Yeah, give me 90 days. Okay, diabetes is a simple mineral deficiency disease. It's not genetic in any way, shape, or form. We've known that for 70 years. It's a simple nutritional deficiency disease. But again, doctors are not obligated to cure you when there's a cure available. They're a protected monopoly. They can do what they want. And as long as you agree to it, everybody's happy. Why is there going to be a diabetes epidemic? 80 million baby boomers come along. Exercise, sweat out your nutrients, drink plenty of water. Don't take vitamins and minerals, you can overdose. I must hear that a thousand times a day if I hear it once. I don't know who to strangle first, the patient or the doctor. And here's why you'll be burying your children. Wall Street Journal, April of this year. No easy cure for diabetic children. Now, we're not talking about type 1. This is type 2. It used to be called adult onset type 2 diabetes because it only occurred in people over the age of 50. Well, that was a long time ago. In 1963, people under the age of 5 never got type 2 diabetes. But look, following the doctors and the government's instructions, eat whole grains, don't eat fat, eat, you know, plenty of exercise, don't supplement. Look what happened. If, if, if the doctors were right and the government was right, the chart should look like that again. Following the instructions, doing what they say, this is what you're getting. And so the kids are dying younger and younger and younger just from type 2 diabetes when nobody should get it. It's a simple mineral deficiency. High blood sugar is not the disease. High blood sugar is, is just a symptom of the disease. Just like elevated blood cholesterol is a symptom of, of type 2 diabetes, it has nothing to do with the cause of the disease, high blood sugar. Do not get statin drugs because they increase your risk of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, by 50%. And this came out, what, in uh, 2012, right? Just like the other one I showed you. I don't get all the easy ones. When I get people with diabetes, I usually get them with complications. Here's some uh, gangrene of the foot. I see gangrene of the legs all the way up to the groin. And a, a good endocrinologist, he loves this. I mean, the toes are crystallizing. There's not much healthy flesh left. So they'll cut the foot off uh, right there at the arch. If it goes up the leg, they'll cut the leg off in the middle of the thigh or up at the groin. Well, with our program, it usually takes 2 to 14 days to wean them off their medication. Now they're an ex-diabetic in 2 to 14 days. It happens, like, all the time. The longest it ever takes is 30, 60 days. But I'd say 80% of them are 2 to 14 days. If they do exactly as I say, they'll wean off their medication because we're giving them the mineral that's missing. But what about the complications? What about blindness? What about heart disease? What, what about gangrene? Well, it just all goes away, usually 30 to 60 days. We do have to have one thing for gangrene. It's called the ultimate daily tablet, just like for vascular dementia and coronary artery disease. For this, I would also add, in addition to the healthy blood sugar pack, which is the healthy starter pack, and the sweeties, appropriate for body weight, if they have complications of the heart, or eyes, or brain, or complications of the gangrene, I, I give them the ultimate daily, get the circulation going. Here's another one that shows they don't know anything. Diabetes cases may double by 2050, and perhaps even triple. Now what does that tell you about their level of knowledge when it comes to the cause of these? They don't know nothing. All they're doing is tracking numbers and treating the same way over and over and over. I remember Albert Einstein. He, 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 he was a Nobel Prize winner, one of my favorites, and he said, many global things are unimpeachable. My favorite is, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. He's the one that came up with that. What, what a beautiful global statement, right? And this just shows how stupid and insane they are. So again, the healthy blood sugar pack, and if they have complications, whatever is necessary to deal with the complications. 
usually within two to 14 days are an ex-diabetic. So if it's not cholesterol that plugs the arteries, what is it? It's inflammation caused the arteries by eating fried foods and eating oils and um, processed meats with nitrates and nitrites. All the things that turn into trans fatty acids, even at room temperature. You go to a restaurant, well, we're very careful to ask, we want salad, but we want it dry. We don't want any dressing on it. Uh, you know, when I go to a restaurant, I have all my eggs poached. At home, I'll soft scramble my eggs in butter because I know I'm using butter. If I ask the cook in, a, in, a, in an IHOP or a Denny's to scramble my eggs in butter, you know what they're going to do? They're going to use honey that tastes like butter because it's cheaper. And they think they're doing me a favor because it's, you know, it's an oil or a margin. I want to be like George Francis. Let be 112, at least. Okay. So the secret killer is not cholesterol. It's, how many of you heard of the Saturday Evening Post? See, young people don't even know it. I thought it was a dead magazine. Ted, I didn't even know it still existed. This is a May-June 2012 issue cover article. Phil, pill shocker, cholesterol meds may be useless. They left out two words. They should have said cholesterol meds may be useless and dangerous. Article's title was The Cholesterol Conundrum. One of the doctors interviewed for the information that article said, everything you've heard about cholesterol and heart disease is wrong. Who told everybody that? Doctors. <laughs> and then a summary of speaking to 12 different doctors, these, these authors of this article spoke to 12 different doctors who were primarily heads of the departments of cardiology at medical school said, here's the summary, cholesterol levels are actually a fairly weak predictor of who will have a heart attack. What? What? Now this is just the opposite of what they said even two weeks before this article came out. Now I said this in 71 and they thought I was an idiot. Now they're saying what I said 41 years earlier. Okay? Cholesterol levels are actually a fairly weak predictor of who will have a heart attack because that's true. Cholesterol has nothing to do with a heart attack. Well, you saw this one earlier. Now this will mean something to you. Good cholesterol, not so beneficial. Higher HDL, high density lipoproteins, the good cholesterol levels don't reduce heart attacks. Lower your cholesterol of any kind, good or bad, doesn't reduce heart attacks because none cause it. You spent a trillion dollars a year for 50 years for nothing. You spent all that money and all that energy and all that consideration in eating stupidly, and you rank 92nd in the world in healthfulness, 60th in longevity. That's what you got for following the doctor's instructions. All these illiterate people out there doing just the opposite of what doctors say, just because they're illiterate, live to be 112. Pediatricians want in on the largest, now they want to get the kickbacks too, so they're going to start giving eight-year-olds statin drugs to lower their cholesterol because they think if we lower the cholesterol levels in kids eight years old, we'll prevent heart disease in adults. And what you're going to say is, no! Do not let them give your kids cholesterol-lowering drugs because they will die before they're 20 and you'll be standing at gravesite burying your children. And the last thing I'm going to share with you is my favorite article on cholesterol. We'll talk about high blood pressure and I'll be done. This is the last one on cholesterol, but it's my favorite article on cholesterol. Normal cholesterol in an 88-year-old man, well, let's call him Frank, who eats 25 eggs a day. Published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is not a big study. This is a case report, but it's very valuable. This guy, Frank, goes in 88 years old for his annual physical. And Dr. Kern, who's a clinical doctor in the outpatient uh, clinic at Harvard Medical School, which teaches you know, young doctors how to be doctors, and that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dr. Kern comes to Frank and says, look, you're in pretty good shape for 88 years old. Man, we couldn't find anything wrong with you. Uh, I'm going to reward you. I'm going to give you a prescription of Viagra. And so Frank stands up and kind of lifts up his belt, you know, and throws his shoulders back and says, well, I'm pretty good in that area. I don't need no Viagra. So the doctor says, really? What, what do you do? What do you do to, to, to be good in that area? He says, well, I eat 25 eggs a day. And the doctor says, what? The doctor's having a heart attack. What? You're eating 25 <laughs> eggs a day. The doctor runs in back in the lab and he reruns it himself. He couldn't believe the numbers. So he comes back and says, well, your blood cholesterol is 190 without medication. And why, why do you eat 25 eggs a day? He says, well, it makes me more studly. <laughs> I want you to think about it. How many of you have heard of estrogen and progesterone? Okay, that's two steroid hormones. How many of you have heard of adrenal hormones? Okay, that's another steroid hormone. How many of you have heard of testosterone? It's another steroid hormone. Those four hormones are steroid hormones. And they're 95% by weight cholesterol. So you go on a cholesterol restricted diet, you take cholesterol lowering drugs, and there ain't nobody home anymore. Okay? You have erectile dysfunction. 
That's why they have so many ads on TV after 10 o'clock at night. There's Bob selling Enzite. <laughs> and the one I really love <clears throat> is Cialis. You know, this couple on the beach in the bathtubs. Now their genetic line is going to die out. They're very stupid. You got to be in the same bathtub before there's the right moment. <laughs> I mean, two slabs of cast iron in between, it ain't nothing going to happen, no matter how good your erection is, right? <clears throat> now, so, you eat six to eight eggs a day, and, you know, Ted and his wife, Nasima, Brandy, they always eat with me a lot on the road. When I go to these places, I'll have a big steak. If it's breakfast time, I'll have four eggs that are poached with a big hamburger patty or a breakfast steak. And you can see all the people in the place are eating their organic multigrain waffles looking at me. <laughs> and they don't even know it. They're dead men walking. <clears throat> so you take your 90 essential nutrients. We actually have an aphrodisiac called Drive. It's a little capsule. And, and the main ingredient is an herb in it. It's an Asian herb called horny goat weed. <laughs> it's a great little herb called Drive. We add that to our, I'll tell you a couple of other things, a lot of fun. Okay, <clears throat> the stealth killer, high blood pressure is a simple mineral deficiency. High blood pressure is not genetic in any way, shape, or term, even, uh, form, even in the black community, it's not genetic. Millions don't manage bl blood pressure. Well, that's because they're treating symptoms, they're, they're not dealing with the cause. The cause is a mineral deficiency. Salt has nothing to do with high blood pressure. What's the first thing a good farmer or rancher puts out for his livestock in the pasture? A salt block or, or salt lick, right? There's nobody out in that pasture telling a cow she's limited to one lick a day, is there? I refuse to believe my human patients are dumber than a cow. Oh, also, if you're biblically orientated, it's kind of fun. God said, go forth and be a salt of the earth, right? I mean, it's in the Bible. And God is forever. Now, doctors say restrict salt, and they live to be 56. I'm going with God. <laughs> Big study. Uh-oh, Houston, we have a problem here. Low sodium intake could be riskier. That's because sodium is an essential nutrient. You cannot have nerve impulses without sodium. You can't move water around in your body without sodium. You can't make stomach acid without chloride. Chloride and sodium are probably the most common of all the mineral cofactors necessary for enzymes and genes to work. Uh-oh, Houston, we have a problem. Now, while this study was designed to deal with high blood pressure in the black community because doctors convince the black community that high blood pressure is genetic in them. This also is true for whites and blacks and yellows and reds and oranges and everybody, right? What they did was go from Loyola University in Chicago and Oxford University in London to uh, Nigeria. They wanted to go up in the mountains of Nigeria and find some tribal guys that had normal blood pressure. They could take their blood samples and they make a vaccine, come back, gen genetically engineered thing, inject it in every black man, woman, and child and get rid of their high blood pressure that way. Well, they get out to Nigeria from, from Oxford University and Loyola University, and they find out that only 7% of the people living in the tribal areas of Nigeria have high blood pressure. 93% are normal. That freaked them out. So they go back to London, they go back to Chicago, and they start doing DNA tests looking for gene pools of people whose uh, ancestors had originated from West Africa during the slave trading days in the 1600s, 1700s. And they found lots of them. They started just simply screening by doing blood pressure, and they found out that the people with the same genetic pool as from West Africa, as the West Africans, 33% uh, high blood pressure. So you know immediately it's not genetic because your position on Earth doesn't dictate or change how a genetic disease will manifest itself. If you have a genetic disease here, you know, in, in um, Minneapolis, you're going to have it in London, you're going to have it in Cape Town, South Africa, you're going to have it in Auckland, New Zealand, doesn't matter where you're on Earth, the genetic disease can be the same. So when there's a five times difference here between your, where you live, you know it's not genetic. <clears throat> well, they didn't like that. So they gathered up more, more blood samples from Nigeria, more blood samples from all over the world, from people who had originated from Nigeria, their ancestors, during the slave trading days. And they got in the geneticists, and they got in the cardiologists, and the blood pressure people, and all this stuff, and they studied for six years. And in 2005, January 2005, they came out with the final results of the study. Remember, doctors want you to believe that it's genetic. This was published in the British Medical Journal, which is their version of the Journal of the American Medical Association, very well respected around the world. And here's what they said, hold on to your hats. High blood pressure in blacks, not genetic. 
High blood pressure in white's not genetic. High blood pressure in yellow's not genetic. High blood pressure in red's not genetic. It's, it's not genetic in anybody. It's a simple mineral deficiency disease. Now, <clears throat> how many of you in this room, particularly the, the black individuals in this room, how many of you had your doctor send you an email in 2005 saying, Praise God! We just learned that high blood pressure in blacks not genetic. You just take the healthy start pack and the ultimate daily tablets, blood pressure goes away in a couple of weeks. Hallelujah! Anybody get that? I've, I speak to black churches all the time. They've, they've never heard of that. You know how many black men have died in the last seven years because they didn't get the information? Over 100,000 from a high blood pressure stroke. Somebody needs to go to jail. Hmm? But they won't because they're a protective monopoly. So how do we deal with this? We tell people ourselves. We, we share this information and get people to do things for themselves. They won't need doctors. And here comes the fun part. In August of 2003, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, of all things, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, in August of 2003, there was a big article in there about an herb that lowers blood pressure. It has flavanols in it. It's called dark chocolate. Not milk chocolate, not Hershey's bars, but dark chocolate has a, a substance in it called flavanols, which lowers blood pressure. Now, it doesn't solve the problem of the mineral deficiency, but it will act like a plant medicine. Herbs are plant medicines. It will lower your blood pressure so you don't have a stroke until you, you're taking enough minerals for you to, to eliminate it permanently, right? But I just keep taking it because I like it. My blood pressure, I'm 73 years old. My blood pressure is uh, 121 over... Uh, uh, 71. Uh, my blood, my pulse is uh, 43. It does spike when I get angry. It'll spike up to 45 when I get angry. Um, when I was wrestling for the University of Missouri, my wrestling pulse was 38, and the doctors were always freaking out, but I could always outrun them, outwhip them, and all this, that, and the other, right? And in addition, dark chocolate has another substance. It's a fun substance called PEAs, phenylethylamines. How many of you have heard of phenylethylamines? Okay, this is the reason why we give chocolate on Valentine's Day, is the phenylethylamines. Now the Spanish, they didn't know the name of the chemical, but they knew there was something special about dark chocolate. So in 1523, they took it to Europe and started giving it away on Valentine's Day. It's, the whole purpose of dark chocolate was to seduce the woman with dark chocolate. It's a, it's PEAs, phenylethylamines, are the love chemical. They're an aphrodisiac, right? It's really great stuff, but it's gotta be dark chocolate. So. In that year, 2003, we came out with a product called Cocogevity. And Cocogevity has flavanols in it, will lower your blood pressure, but it's also loaded with PEAs. <laughs> it always works, guys. So, when Valentine's comes up, and it's coming up in a couple of months, don't give chocolates, give Cocogevity and reap the awards. Reap the rewards, I guess. <laughs> okay. If you like pieces of chocolate rather than liquids, I, I like the liquid. I add it to my coffee. We own a coffee company called Java Fit, and it made us publicly traded. One of the things we do if you, um, I personally, I don't take anything from the company, even though I started the company, I don't take anything from it. I give it all back to you guys. You know, if you help other people, the more people you help, the bigger your check gets. This gets good, okay. Anyway, triple treat chocolate. <laughs> triple treat chocolate. Triple treat chocolate. Why is it called triple treat? because it lowers blood pressure. It has probiotics in it, which gives you good digestive stuff and gives you the best sex life you've ever had. Triple treat, right? Because it has flavanols in it to lower blood pressure, but it also has PEAs in it, phenylethylamines. Huh, good stuff. Now two of these, two of these chocolates gives you 33,000 antioxidant points, 33,000 auric points, which is right in the half way mark between 20,000 and 50,000 these top 20 longevity people. Lower blood pressure, 33,000 auric points and PEAs. I mean, how good does that get? And we also have another one called Triple Truffle. In addition, it has 500 milligrams of um, usable calcium per piece, which is the size of a pat of butter, and 1,000 international units of vitamin D3. So if you take three of those, you're getting 1,500 milligrams of, of usable calcium and 3,000 international units of vitamin D3, which is the minimum daily requirement for vitamin D3. Now, this is not a standalone product, obviously. You add that to the 90 essential nutrients and whatever else you got going. So that's sort of, and I could go on with, you know, 894 other diseases, but we don't have time for that. But you can read the book, Dead Doctors Don't Lie, uh, Let's Play Doctor, and so on. I go through those diseases with you and tell you what to do for them. 
And so what I'm going to do now is turn this over to Brandy and to Seema and Ted, and they're going to give you some information. And you can flip on the lights now. All the lights can go up. And I will uh, then answer questions for you for about, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes. And we'll have a lot of fun and save a lot of people. OK, thank you very much. Who <laughs> up?